This week we're discussing Tales from the Crypt number 1, Scarlet Witch number 13, Champions number 3, Clone Conspiracy number 3, Harley Quinn number 9, Batman number 12, Nightwing number 10, and All New Wolverine number 15. Uh, and just a spoiler warning, um, there's your spoiler warning. Thanks. What's up, everyone? This is the Columbus Comics Corner podcast, episode 11. Um, 11. My name is Ryan. As always, with me is Alan. How you doing? Doing good. Good, good, yeah. We got some, uh, got some new news to talk about. We got some uh, comic book news to touch on as well. And then we're going to get into the, the meat of the, of the episode or the comics. Um, but before all that, um, make sure you always check out, you can find all of our podcast episodes. Uh, at columbuscommonscorner.podbean.com follow us on twitter at columbus comics corner um, our blog spot is columbus Com- columbus comics corner uh, dot blogspot dot com and if you ever want to email us columbus comics corner at gmail dot com and we are on, are on itunes so uh, you can subscribe rate and view us there and all that good stuff um, but as for yeah again we are a spoilers podcast um, once we do get to the comics um, but before that, we do have um, some entertainment news that um, dropped just a couple days ago that came out of nowhere for me. Yeah. Uh, well, that bit of entertainment news is actually, I'm sure a lot of our um, listeners probably have seen it by now because it's been everywhere. Everywhere. But it is the first official trailer for Spider-Man Homecoming. They dropped the uh, U.S. trailer and the international trailer at the same time. I think it's been out now for a couple of days and yeah this was a very interesting trailer that a lot of us including myself have really been waiting for um, you, you weren't aware it was coming out I think me and you talked the day it was coming out and I let you know that it was supposed to drop later on that night mm-hmm. yep. um, did you get to watch it that night or did you watch it the next day yeah it actually came online I want to say probably like a half hour after it aired on uh, Jimmy Kimmel yeah, and then the international uh, trailer came like ten minutes after the the first one. But yeah. all right, so what what was your opinion on this trailer? Um, I liked the uh, inter- international trailer um, more. I liked one of it was shorter. You know, even though since it was shorter, it didn't still didn't give. It still had the same stuff, but like certain things that cut up that were like cut out that probably um, you know didn't have to be there. Some of the conversations mm-hmm. were more. Um, filled in um, the music worked well for this um, in my opinion more than the the American um, trailer that we got um, but the, the American trailer the music felt you know more pushing towards uh, like the younger crowd um, which is yeah, which uh, is expected uh, uh, I was I was just thinking when you said the music, um, you, you were probably more talking about the uh, the first scene where we see Peter in high school. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I think that's what they were going for because mm-hmm. this it one is going to take place with him in high school, so they did kind of um, seem like they wanted more of a high school feel, at least for yeah. that aspect of Spider Man. Mm-hmm. But you're right, the international one. I think the music was a little uh, dare I use the word epic? Uh, kind of. It was it was tamed. Yeah. Almost, <laughs> yeah. it was different. I mean, it was, it was a little more heroic. Yes, yeah, we'll say heroic. Um, but we got we got a little little bit more shocker. Um, actually, yes. got to see him full on in the international trailer, opposed to just the the ham that was shown in the um, in the uh, American trailer. And Michael now, Keaton is yeah. A Michael badass. Keaton looks good as Vulture. Have you seen Birdman? No, um, um, I was just at a um, holiday luncheon a few days ago, and we got to talking about movies, and somebody brought up Birdman, uh, which led me to bring up Spider-Man, because, mm-hmm. that, I mean, essentially, that's pretty much what, you know, put him in high demand for trying to get him in this movie was his performance in Birdman. I've been hearing it's good, but I have not seen it yet. It is, it is a great movie. Um, one, definitely one of my faves. I would definitely uh, recommend watching that, because... 
you know, you wouldn't expect him to be so like uh, villainous as Michael Keaton. Mm-hmm. But if you see Birdman, like he kind of has like two personalities in a way. Um, yeah, I'm all I'm all about Michael Keaton, and, and the overall feel of the trailer was great to me. Uh, yeah. Tony Stark, Tony Stark stuff was cool. It was funny. Um, I hope they don't overuse him too much in the movie. Like help him like get uh, get Spider Man set up, kind of thing. Um, th- that's what I think they're probably gonna do. They're probably just gonna have him set up. You know, um, from the teaser tra- trailer they had, he gives him an upgrade, which I think the the teaser made it seem like he gives him the upgrade of the suit with the um with the webbing underneath it. Okay. Um, yeah, I didn't see but it I don't think the teaser he, trailer. You haven't seen the teaser? Yeah, because the teaser, um, Happy's in there. It's in the teaser. The teaser is um, Peter, and he's in the hotel room with Happy, and he's got, um, they don't show the costume. Looks like he might have one of his um, old costumes he was wearing. Mm-hmm. And uh, Happy tells him, like, you know, open the box, and he reads the, the letter on the box, and it says, here's an upgrade, kid, uh, T.S., and so he opens the box up and says, oh, this is so cool. Like and then Riri. they show that part where he's jumping over a helicopter. Kind of like Riri, issue one. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly that's exactly what it felt like. When they showed it, that's exactly what I thought about. I was like, that's just like Riri in the garage. Yeah. You know, he sent her the little box. And he's like, here you go. You're going to need this. And, uh, yes, yeah, so I think that's that's the, the, the role that Tony's going to play. I know they showed him and Iron Man in the trailer, but I'm guessing that's going to be something towards the end of the movie. Yeah, it was cool to see uh, John Favreau in the background. Yeah. Him again, that was cool. I was like, oh, yeah. He's in the family, the Marvel family. Um, and um, I, I had seen the um, set photos earlier a few months ago when they first showed a glimpse of the Shockers, and I liked the way they made the Shocker look. Uh, it, it was interesting seeing him and like you said the international one you get a, a better glimpse so if people didn't know Shocker was in there you know you, from the US one you might just see the hand and be like uh, could that possibly be Shocker yeah, yeah. but then you see the international one like you said you see more of them like oh yeah that is Shocker yeah because you see a couple of people using um, that type of weapon so yeah if you would have just saw the hand you wouldn't have maybe not known it was a uh, Shocker if you're not if you weren't too familiar or something like you said just speaking of which, uh, I loved the opening scene of the trailer with the bank robbery, where they're like robbing the ATM. Yeah, and they, and they have the Avenger mask on. He's like, "Wait a minute, you guys aren't the Avengers." It kind of reminded me, not in a bad way, but uh, kind of reminded me of uh, Batman um, when uh, they're robbing the bank at the beginning. Oh. I know what you're talking mask. about. I, the, I didn't think you would go there. I thought you were going to compare it to um, Suicide Squad. They had that part in Suicide Squad uh, when they yeah. were. They had that. They had, that had like the Batman mask on and stuff. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, but the like, thing it didn't is, bother me too much. It was it was a quirky little thing. But it works for Spider Man like that. Yeah. If you're going to do something like that, like it doesn't, it didn't really work too too much in Batman per se. But when you think of Spider Man, like that was just perfect, like because it gives him that chance to to show that Spider Man com- the comedy made. That was like a Spider Man scene out the comic where he was like, "Wait a minute, you guys are the Avengers? No, you're not the Avengers. <laughs> I knew it wasn't you guys when I saw the Hawks." And uh, there was there's one thing I was like really looking into after I watched it again today. Actually, when Michael mm-hmm. Keaton says uh, the world is changing, I was yes, like, like that's pretty awesome because. It kind of like harkens to Spider Man being in this universe, these new villains that are coming into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, it, it was it was funny because he's talking to a group of people, and I've, I've seen a few things since the trailer. Obviously, since this trailer came out, everyone's been breaking it down and analyzing everything. And there's an idea that that comment is like, like you said, hinting at you know the fact that Spider Man is now in this Marvel Universe. So things are going to be a lot different than what we thought they were going to be. Mm-hmm. But on top of that, it looks like that so I've seen a couple of things where they think that might be um, something that Marvel did as part of the deal with Sony to help them still set up that Sinister Six they wanted to do. Okay. Because from what I know, the Vulture um, outfit or suit, the technology he's using is going to be based off of the Chitauri technology recovered from Avengers. Okay, which looks great, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I did. I like the, the... the suit, especially when you get a, a better look at it, because he still has, like, the um, fur that the Vulture yep. had in comics around mm-hmm. the neck. But it's like a leather jacket now. Yeah. 
I thought it was a dare. And I like that that little. That's like a little touch, but it still keeps it like in the realm of being vulture. There was maybe the same photo you were thinking that one that was uh, on the photo set of Shocker when he was like in the yellow, like the hint yep. of the yellow. And he's got the full mask on. Yeah. So I try to stay. It's like a leather jacket, now. and he's got like the the yellow and black stripes uh, going down the shoulders and stuff. Mm-hmm. I try to stay away from that stuff, but then like, if it comes up on like a feed and I see it, I'm like, damn it. <laughs> try to skip past I, it. I do too, but the crazy thing is, is when they were talking about this movie originally, and was talking about like we're going to take Spider Man back to high school, and of course, I was one of those people like, well, you know, this is the second Spider Man reboot that's been done. Please do not let it be an origin story. And then they did the Civil War where they're like, you know, he's been Spider Man for six months all around my coup, so we're not going to get an origin story. And I was thinking more along the lines that the beginning of the movie should be something akin to um, maybe. A montage type thing where it just kind of shows him doing the, the mundane Spider-Man thing, you know, stopping bank robbers and you know burglars and stuff like that. And I was even thinking, like, you know, you could sprinkle in some of the the lesser threatening uh, Spider-Man villains. And I specifically named Shocker. Like I always said, like you can have him like fighting Shocker or something at the beginning, because then we get you know a well-known Spider-Man villain, but he's not really a high-level threat. Yeah. And that kind of helps set up, like, you know, his. his uh, path threat. to become a, the hero he wants to be, and then sure enough, they decide to use the shocker. I'm like, man, I need to go work for Marvel. <laughs> Don't we all? Yeah, because I was straight pitch that in a meeting. Like, what if we had Shocker in the movie? No, no, he doesn't have to be the main villain. Just, just we we'll have Shocker. Yeah, it'll work better than Rhino. Yeah, that was probably the worst part of that movie. That, and that was like the end of the movie too. It was the end of the Literally movie, the and end. Rhino is not somebody that I would have set up at the end of a movie. If anything, he would have been with the rest of the Sinister Six. Like I'd have had him at the beginning of the next movie, or at the beginning of the actual Sinister Six movie, while they're you know, because the route they were going was. Oscorp was make was going to make everybody. Everything's coming from Oscorp. Mm-hmm. So I, it did, and I never saw Paul Giamatti as Rhino either. That too, <laughs> with his his crazy Russian accent he was throwing on. Yeah, that, I'm the Rhino. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that did not work. Uh, but yeah, that, that was a great trailer. Um, July seventh, um, I saw. So yeah, it comes out around my birthday. Nice. It's going to be a pack I'm, year. I'm, I'm pretty sure I know one of my birthday presents. Oh. Awesome. Cool. Well, we can move on to the uh, the comic book news that we have. Um, we okay. got quite a bit um, this week. Um, so this is all um, from newsarama.com. And the uh, first one is about DC. And the title is Classic Captain Adam Creators. Uh, get to the core of the character for Rebirth uh, adjacent series. Um, so, and it says, um, as Rebirth scales back some of the elements from the New 52, getting characters back to their core, quote unquote, um, as the publisher describes it, a new DC miniseries is taking that transition to a new level. Not only will the fall and rise of Captain Adam see the rebirth of the character, but the two writers who were originally responsible for his modern core uh, will be the ones doing it. Carrie Bates and Greg Wiseman, the two writers responsible for the 1980s revamp um, of the Charlton Congress hero, will reunite, reunite um, for the six-issue miniseries, uh, working with artist uh, Will Conrad. The two will also revamp uh, fan-favorite Captain Atom-related uh, characters, including General Eiling and Dr. Mangala. Um, Wiseman is mo- more recently known for his work as a producer on the uh, animated series, which I thought this was really cool. I did not know this. Um, like Gargoyles and Star Wars Rebels. Um, Bates, who has also uh, dabbled in an- animation, is probably best known for his work on Superman, along with many of the other DC characters in various comic books over the years. Um, so that sounds exciting. Um, I've always been a Captain Adam fan um, from whatever like read of him, and yeah, sounds like they're getting the you know some of the old or you know the original writers on this team for this uh, mini series to spin off. Yeah, it sounds like they're getting the band back together. Yeah. Well, nice um, rebirth. I've, I've always respected Captain Adam. Um, never been a huge fan. 
mm-hmm. but I've respected him. He's always been um, one of those characters I've always seen as like a secondary Justice League member, yeah. and that might be because of my experience with him from like the cartoons and whenever I do see him in the comics is normally as like an extended Justice League member mm-hmm. but uh I mean this, this could this could work and any it's, it's good to see that they have the foresight to get back the people who, re, who revamped them in the first place yes so you know they did it once they made them you know a pretty you know popular character let's see if they can do it again and then seeing the credits like I'm just gonna say Gargoyles is one of my favorite shows ever growing same, up. Like I still have the, the Gargoyles DVDs. Like so anybody even remotely associated with Gargoyles, I'm given a chance to do whatever. Same. Yeah, when I saw that I was like, Oh, that's awesome. That harking back. And but I still haven't seen Star Wars Rebels. Um I started Clone Wars, but I didn't get uh far yet. Not that I didn't like it. It was it's different, uh, for me. But um I I have not finished Clone Wars. I've seen a few episodes of Rebels, and Rebels is good. That's what everyone says. Yeah, Rebels is really good. I've only seen like three, maybe four episodes of it. Okay. But no, yeah, I look forward to that. Um, hopefully, the miniseries you know, does well. Maybe it'll spin off into something else. But I'll keep saying it. I'm still waiting for uh, JSA. Still, you know what? Waiting. <laughs> Same here. Uh, I love the fact that characters like Adam are getting some kind of recognition because it's always good to see. You want to see your the 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 flagship characters get recognition. You want to see your Supermans, your Batmans, your Wonder Womans. But it's good to see people like you know Green Arrow. Now we're getting Adam. Uh, Vixen's been getting some play lately. Like it's yep. good to see those those secondary. Excuse me, supporting characters, because the co- comics and the comic universe are more than just you know the, those flagships. There's so many other characters and stuff in there, and even if they're secondary characters, it's good to see them get used used because that kind of shows how big the universe is and shows like, well, yeah, there's your we're defending the planet type heroes, and then there's your smaller we're defending you know a, a nation or a city type heroes or even a, a, a neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's good to see stuff like this. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, Jay Garrett's hat or helmet um, actually appeared in one of the uh, most recent Flash issues. I heard. Really? Yeah. Jay so, Garrick. Hmm. Hmm. So they're they're sprinkling it out there. It's it's they're, de- they're definitely gonna do it's, that. It's funny because even though you know. Um, we, we, even though we have new incarnations of some of these golden age heroes, you know your Barry Allens and your uh, Wally West. Even though we have these new incarnations, I still like some of the classics. Same, and it's fun to see and hear when the classics pop up. That was always one of my favorite things about the. I think they did it in Young Justice, and they did it on. I don't know if they did it on Justice League, but they had it where um, Jay Garrick popped up. And it kind of comes out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. But anytime you see certain Golden Age heroes pop up, it's fun. Because some of them are still classic. Some, some of those Golden Age heroes are still classic. You know, you can have them be the older characters or whatever and have them be past their prime. But for nostalgia reasons and for historical reasons, it's fun to see them kicking around still. Exactly. No doubt about that. Man, I've been falling off on uh, watching the superhero shows. But I really want to watch the most recent Flash because uh, it has um, Top and uh, Jay Garrick and Mark Hamill is uh, playing Top. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I'm behind an episode on everything. I'll probably end up watching that actually tonight when we get off the air. I'll probably end up watching that. It's probably good. Though. But even, even when they first had him appear on The Flash and they officially said he was Jay Garrick, I was so geeked. Like, oh, yeah. the he's a Jay Garrick. I'm, yeah. My girl's like, who's Jay Garrick? I'm like, that's 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 the original. That's the OG. <laughs> that's, that's the original Flash. That's the original. Oh. Uh. But yeah, it's good that they're on a break at least the season winter break or whatever. I'll give me some time to catch up. Yeah, that give you time to to catch up. But yeah, let's uh, let's move on from there. 
Um, yeah, because I'm curious about this next piece of inf- this next piece of news. Yeah, yeah. So you haven't um, heard anything about this yet? So this will be your first. No, time. and this is something we were just talking about last mm-hmm. week. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, this stuff will be the rest of the comic news is uh, from Marvel. Um, so again, from Newsarama, uh, creators and details on Marvel's cables ongoing um, from X Men Resurrection line. And it says the creative team and plot for the 2017 Cable ongoing series has been announced by Marvel. Uh, one-time Cable writer James Robinson is returning to the title um, with veteran illustrator uh, Carlos uh, Pacheco. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, and with the in what is the sixth and final for now uh, X-Men book coming as part of the New Resurrection uh, joint line with the Inhumans. Um, the big um, conduit of the new album uh, book, uh, according to Robinson, is Nathan Summers' um, expertise as a time traveler with time sliding, as the 1990s readers will recall. Um, and you can find more on that story at newsarama.com. Um, this one I'm probably most excited about right now, just because after reading. James Robbins or Jim Robinson this week for the first time. I've heard his name a bunch, um, but he he's been writing Scarlet Witch, and I really really enjoyed Scarlet Witch this week. Um, and he wrote some Starman as well that I'm going to catch up on. Um, but yeah, I, he's I'm excited for this. Probably my most excited book right now from the Resurrection line, next to um, well actually. Did we say last week that... Oh, yeah, Generation X is coming. Yeah, okay, so, yeah, Cable and then Generation X are, like, my most anticipated ones. And see, this this is probably my maybe third most anticipated book from that line, because first, obviously, is Generation X for me. And then, of course, is X-Men Go... Or is it Blue? Blue. Hmm. And then it will be Cable. And especially because I've been talking about Cable on some of the last couple episodes where I've brought Cable up, like how are they going? When are they going to actually bring Cable in, and what's his role going to play? Yeah, buddy. So I definitely want to see where this is going to go, especially since they're keeping him in his element of, of time travel. Mm-hmm. So I'm It'll wondering, is this somehow going to be the the original cable from 616 who somehow time traveled and got that's how he got around the whole Secret Wars thing. Hmm. Because that would be interesting if he like shifted time before All that the Secret happened. Wars happened. He was like in a time stream or something while Secret Wars was happening and he popped back up now in this slightly changed universe. I wouldn't mind if they did something like that. That, that would be crazy. And then he could see he could see like kid apocalypse and he could freak out because he's like it's apocalypse and they're like well it's not really apocalypse no it's apocalypse. <laughs> Made me up with a uh, squirrel girl. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Car- or cable and Howard the Duck. I like to see that. Car- They've done it before already. I like to see it again. Yeah, it is the implications of using cable in are big I am about it um, so yeah this one so this piece of news just dropped I want to say yesterday um, this is the last of the comic book news um, X-Men yes. Resurrection kicks off with X-Men Prime um, and it reads the relaunch of Marvel's X-Men line dubbed Resurrection will kick off with a one shot entitled X-Men Prime uh, which picks up directly after Inhumans vs. X-Men the standalone issue will set the stage for the X-Men status quo and introduce the new teams that they are part of the line or that are part of the line. Um, X-Men Prime is a book that represents the X-Men line going forward as everyone plants their seeds. Um, editor David Ketchum told Entertainment Weekly, uh, "We're just at the tail end of the war. Uh, or yeah, we're just at the tail end of the war. They're literally picking up the pe- picking up the pieces." Um, the one shot will be written by writers of the upcoming X Men titles, including Mark Guggenheim of X Men Gold, Colin Bunn of X Men Blue, and Dennis Hopeless, or Dennis Hopeless of Jean Grey, Cena, 
Cena Grace of Iceman, James Robinson of Cable, and Christina Strain of Generation X. Uh, Clint Lashley will provide art for the issues. And there were some sketches um, that were shown on the site as well um, that, that I liked a lot. But I'm definitely uh, I'm glad they're doing a one shot. Makes sense that they would, and kind of showcasing what all these writers are gonna bring to the table. Um, so I look forward to that. We'll so they'll probably be getting that relatively soon um, after Inhumans X Men wraps up. I think that because um, they did that with X Men versus Inhumans, um, what they did was that issue zero. Mm hmm. That was like the tie between issue between Death of X and Inhumans versus X Men, and I think it's smart to have a tie-in issue after the um, Inhumans versus X Men is over. The tie-in with the Resurrection is with everything that's coming up next. So I think that's a smart move. I agree. Because I am, I'm still curious about uh, Mark Guggenheim's writing and uh, Colin Bunn and. Cause I'm, I'm familiar with Dennis Hopeless, so all the other ones I'm interested, all right, and James Robinson, um, the other ones I'm interested to see um, what their their first take on it is um, and what they publish to show to everyone. Well, yeah. I know if I'm, I'm I'm sure they're always going to do do a good job, but for whatever reason, the writing is not that strong and the stories aren't going well. I just want to say right now, Marvel. You can contact me at Columbus Comics Corner <laughs> at gmail.com. At gmail.com. I'll be happy to come on and give you some uh, some some good ideas. I, I, X Men was my first team, and mutants were 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 really big on me. Like I, I started with uh, Flash and Spider Man, but when I found about the X Men, I kind of gravitated towards the X Men, and I've always revisited X Men over the years. And there's so much. That's one of the one of the. I don't necessarily want to say franchise, even though it is a franchise. But that's one of the franchises in comic books with the most potential because there's so many great characters and so many possibilities to tell great stories with these characters. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Sweet. So yeah, that is the uh, the comic book news that we have for this week. Um, I'm sure something probably dropped or will drop after we record um but probably but from there um oh yeah just a uh, quick note uh ben from uh, nerd church radio uh, wasn't actually able to jo actually able to join us this week to discuss batman number 12 um, but we are going to reschedule him to get back on um hopefully for the the next batman book in two weeks um but we'll see how that goes and hopefully it all works out um but we are going to move into the uh the comics now and uh, yeah, th I just want to say real fast, I, mm -hmm. it's it's a pity he can't join us today. Um, sometimes you know things come up and you can't you know uh, do things like this. Mm -hmm. You know he's supposed to talk to us about that Batman. I was really looking forward to seeing his opinion on it because this was a great issue and a very interesting issue. And I can't wait till we get to it to be able to discuss it for sure, for sure. But we are going to start with uh, Tales from the Crypt number one first. Uh, your book. Yes, Tales from the Crypt number one, which has been ducking and dodging us for almost a month now. Yeah, it was probably what? Yeah, I went probably a month. It was back in October, it was like mid October, I think, when it was yeah, supposed to originally right. dropped. Halloween time. Yeah. And we will this find is supposed out. to be one of our Halloween books. We'll find out. But it finally came. So <laughs> it, it finally came, so we're, we're tackling it tonight. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sure most people are uh, aware of Tales from the Crypt, the TV show from the 90s. Obviously, um, it was a big part of a lot of our childhood. Uh, it used to be a comic book once upon a time, and they've come back. And this is this pretty much plays out like the TV show would, where you have the, um, the well, in the comic book, it's actually three people. It's the Crypt Keeper, the Old Witch, and the Fault Keeper. But each one of them tells you a ghoulish, scary, funny, weird story. And the first story is about a trillionaire who has managed to stay alive by paying off people to actually donate their organs to him so that he can prolong his life. And we see him actually um, receiving the kidneys, both the kidneys, from a young woman in exchange for him actually paying um, money to her family. 
and he tells her at the last minute that he's actually not going to pay as much as he promised because he just wants her kidneys he's rich she's essentially poor she's nothing and this is just the way it works she should have read the fine print and then it flash forwards a few decades and it turns out that um his company has come under fire because it's been testing pesticides on children at a um uh, and the public obviously is outraged at this and they start protesting and damaging his property and they're in front of his home and he's told by his board members that you know they're getting a little antsy and that he needs to come up with a way to fix this he's, he doesn't think there needs to be a way until somebody actually breaks in and tries to kill him and then he decides to hire a PR agent and being the rich scum he is he decides that he needs the best PR agent that there is and he hires her and she comes over with a plan to say like what we're do is we're actually take your money that are on all these um, companies and stuff that people are a little bit iffy about like pesticides oil and gas and chemicals and we're actually have you transfer them to dummy companies that say that they support you know solar energy and the environment and um, organics and wind energy and things and jobs and we're doing this live on the air so that everybody can see it and everybody this instantly help change your public perception so uh, he gets ready for this and she actually has him put a robe on instead of a suit. And he's like, well, why a robe? And he's like, because it'll make you more accessible. And then it turns out that she's actually tricked him. And she's uh, amassed a bunch of doctors and people over the years who have issues with him because he's um, done similar things to their families or he's went back on deals with them. And it turns out that she is actually the daughter of the woman from the beginning of the story and that what she did was she went to school, the money he gave didn't help finish school, so she finished school and she worked her way up the ladder in order to get in this position to actually take him out. End of story one. End of story one. Did, did you have anything for this one? Yeah. Um, I didn't know what to um I kind of had an idea of what I was going to get into this uh yeah. the first story wasn't you know kind of what I expected um it it uh kind of like dragged for me in a way and then it was super depressing and then um <laughs> <laughs> cuz I kind of had had the uh the almost not politics but kind of had the that kind of story to it, you know, the the rich man, you know, and then the whole like politics thing of let's show people that we give our money to, you know, certain things that they want to see so we can, you know, amp up our PR, everyone will like us and, you know, consider us a good person even though he's a piece of shit. But I do like the twist of, uh, you know, we do see the mother at the beginning and then the daughter um, setting him up, you know, playing as his PR agent and setting him up at the end um, and yeah get, getting her payback which made sense she got it in a huge way because she 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 didn't lie about live streaming this like they actually did play this live on TV for the world to see and it was funny because she was saying that the seats inside the studio like they sold for like 10 million a piece mm -hmm. so even some of his you know, rich fat cat friends were still like, you know what? We don't like you. <laughs> Everyone was just ready to get rid of him. Yeah. Yeah, I guess like, because since it was like coming out around Halloween, I mean, it is a, a horror story in a way. And you're more familiar with uh, Tales from the Crypt than I am. Like, I, I watched it when I was like a kid, but I you know, don't really remember much of it. Um, was it these sort of stories as well? Or was it just... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A, a, a lot of times they were like tongue-in-cheek type stories. There were a couple that were like pretty much like a straight horror story. But for the most part, they were things like this. Okay. All of these stories were... were when I was reading this, I was thinking like all of these stories could have been an episode of Tales from the Crypt. Like they all fit in with yeah, what guess, an episode of that show would have been. Yeah, I guess this the first, the first issue... Um, of this book yeah I guess I did. that one I was like yeah but then it, the next one though I was like yeah that seems like something uh, from the show but yeah the first one kind of just threw me off yeah this would have been an episode all of these would have been an episode for, for the show oh and off topic um, I forgot to ask you oh go ahead what was your mm -hmm. uh, favorite um, issue from Batman Annual last week because I forgot to ask you Oh, um, 
I had actually had three. There was three of those that I really liked, all for different reasons. One was obviously the uh, the one with Ace the Bat Hound. Uh, just the number and one. And then that was the first one. And then I liked the second one, second story, which was the one with the Agrobats. And then, of course, the Harley Quinn. If I had to pick one, it would have been a tie between Ace and Harley Quinn. Okay. Word. I forgot to ask you. My favorite one was Silent Night. So, cool. Just okay. want to get that out there on the record. <laughs> Oh, no, that's fine. This is what we do on the show. We have tangents sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, the next uh, one. But we can go into the next. Yeah, the one, next though. one, Zombie Bank, which is the one that you you said that you obviously like. I did too. But um, Zombie Bank features a uh, man working in a bank, and he has tells us that the world has turned into zombies, and he's the only normal person left, and that the zombies take pride in actually um beating him up and insulting him and degrading him and the worst one is the uh, the one who runs the bank who's actually the one to turn everybody into zombies and we just get glimpses of his day to day life where, you know they're tripping him and they're giving him all this extra work to do and sending him on food orders and he orders the wrong food or throwing the food on him and it turns out that there's one other person who is a uh, human still who works at the bank and it's a woman and he, she's actually nice to him. Her name is Julia, Julie. And he actually starts falling for Julie because she's the only person that shows him compassion and seems nice to him. And he actually thinks that she may be in love with him until he walks in and finds her in a compromising position with the head of the bank. And he gets yelled at and turns out the next day when he sees her, she's turned into a zombie. And this is the last straw for him. He can't take it anymore. And so he grabs a letter opener, takes his tie out, ties him on his head Rambo style, gets some ink toner, paints his face, and then he actually goes and stabs and kicks the owner of the bank and cuts his heart out to give it to Judy. And then he gets arrested because it turns out that nobody is a zombie. He has actually lost his mind from the job. Everybody thinks he's crazy and he gets arrested and taken off at the end but he's still proclaiming that he saved everybody and by killing the boss he turned everybody back into normal people and they are no longer cursed for being zombies uh, it's funny that you said Rambo because that was like on my notes <laughs> oh yeah he went Rambo he shit Rambo even even the way they drew it because they drew it from the back when he was tying it on mm-hmm. and it reminded me of that scene in Rambo when he's gearing up and you see him from the back and ties the headband on real tight and then he spins around and was like yeah that's Rambo he's putting the uh, face paint on yeah he put the the, the ink toner he used the ink toner as face paint I thought the art was uh, probably in this whole uh, comic probably the best of the three uh, three stories this is my, one of my favorite favorite one um, but yeah I like um, the art the art varies the, through the different stories, but I think mm-hmm. especially for this, I actually think the art fit this story. Yes, because it was like kind of kind of gritty a little bit. Yeah, I like the idea of um, him, you know, end up going crazy. Um, it it kind of would be cool if he did live in this like fucked up world after doing this, but uh, it's cool the the way they played it though was fine. Yeah, yeah, because at first I was with the story from his perspective that everyone was zombies and he was like one of the only normal people. And then they did the reveal at the end of the story. I'm like, oh, so he's he's been crazy this whole time. This this job has actually dr- driven him insane. Yes, like some jobs will, and yeah. a lot of people could relate to this. Oh yeah, I, guess I think the- that was the good thing about the story because a lot of people can relate to that to yeah. being at a job. And especially with him, because he felt like an outcast because everybody, even if you take out the fact that they weren't zombies and you see the way they were talking to him and how they were treating him and everything, like, you know, they if, if this was school, he was essentially being bullied. No, but I do like the art, though. My favorite panel is probably when um, it's a panel of just Julie's face. And she's like saying, she, uh, she said, no hard feelings. Solid, solid art. My, my my favorite panel is the Rambo panel. <laughs> that would be my next. That that was awesome to me. Him stabbing his boss, that was great. 
Oh yeah, and he stabbed him in the head with the the um letter opener. Mm-hmm. He stabbed him in the chest first. No, he stabbed him in the head. Then he stabbed him in the in chest. The chest yeah. Cut his heart out. And presents it to Julie. It's like a fucking bloodbath in there. But that's cool. Yeah, like pretty short stories, um, but they uh, they wrap up decently at least. Yeah, just just like episodes of Tales from the Crypt, like yeah, they're, they're yeah. short stories. Some of them are real simple stories, and they wrap up pretty fast. Um, so that actually brings us then to the last story in the book, which is the Werewolf of Wall Street, where somebody has been killing off Wall Street execs, and we have a couple of police officers who are actually there interviewing um, one of the execs or sit, that sits on the board of this company. And I'm telling him, like, you know, some of your other friends have been killed, so you actually you need kind of protection. And he's like, well, no, I have my security force, and I trust them to handle it. And the uh, two officers have a conversation after they leave, you know, talking about how, you know, one of the officers lost his, all his retirement fund, basically, because of the antics going on on Wall Street, and he had some money invested, and he lost all of his money. And his, his opinion is, you know, if they die, they die. That's what they deserve. And so then it turns out the next day that the exec they just talked to uh, shows up murdered. And then we actually see the officer who lost his pension. He's retiring. And um, as he goes home, his partner follows him. And she looks in through his window and actually sees like he wasn't joking about the fact that he's hit hard times and he lost all of his money because he's sitting there eating a can of dog food. And she actually goes in and notices, she sneaks in and notices that um, he's got a bunch of newspaper clippings about all the murders. And, and she realizes, like, well, maybe he is a part of these murders, but it doesn't make any sense because the victims were essentially torn apart by some kind of animal. And then she turns around. And he tells her, like, you know, you don't lose sleep over the fact that they're dead. They were scum. And she's trying to ask him, like, well, how did you do this? And then he transforms into a werewolf in front of her. And he actually goes to attack her, and she shoots him dead. And then she cracks a little joke about, you know, I guess I mean, it's a good thing the myth about silver bullets are wrong because I'd have been dead. And then she picks up the um, can of dog food, and she's wondering, like, but this doesn't, uh, this doesn't explain how exactly... You know, he turned into this. And then we flash to a canning factory in Russia, and we actually see the, um, I think it's the vault keeper. Is it the vault keeper? Yeah, I believe it's the vault keeper. Mm-hmm. Hang up some dog food, saying that the answer is obvious to anybody who can see and who's willing to look. Sometimes the actions of one vengeful old gypsy woman can take down an entire empire. That is the end of the last story. What were your opinions on this one? Um, it was okay. Um, I like the the noir type esque uh, detective work that was going on. Um, kind of like a detective story, you know, in the midst of this uh, weird, creepy dog food uh, fucked up factory. That you know, uh, it's hard times for everyone. I guess again, it's a little a little depressing. Um, I read some some depressing books, but I guess it's like it hits on a lot of the social commentary, like a little bit too much right now. Yeah, um, just for my <laughs> taste personally. Um, but overall, I mean, it's not I I didn't dislike the story. Um, yeah. Well, I know most of the not all of them, but some of the episodes of uh, the show mm-hmm. they had social commentary into in the stories. You know, being younger, you don't notice that kind of stuff, really. You know, it's one of those things where you go back and watch them when you're older, you're like, oh, that's what they were talking about. Finally realize. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I like elements of this one. For me, personally, I thought this was the slightly weaker of the three stories. Um, I, I definitely like, enjoyed I like the first the two stories more you. than this one. I do like when she, like, does uh, go to his house, though, and actually sees him, like, sitting by himself like eating the dog food like, eating the dog food it. yeah that was sad that yeah. was actually sad I was like wow that's sad yeah, the guy sitting there eating dog food and just before he's like at that party with his friends for his birthday oh well, and he gets a bullet blam 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 
Yeah, but this is my first introduction to Tales from the Crypt in comic book form. Same here. I know these. I know these used to be huge, you know, back when uh, we had the fall of uh, superheroes and comics for a little while. Um, detective stories and horror comics were really huge. Mm -hmm. From what I've seen, this does seem to still um, harken back to that time. It does kind of feel like it, it feels like I reached back in time and pulled this this um, comic out. It doesn't feel necessarily like a new comic per se. And f to me, that's just because I, I know the history of horror comics in the comic book industry and when they were huge and the kind of stories they would tell and that's just what it feels like even with the cover the cover feels like a, a throwback comic yeah mm -hmm. especially but, but that's uh, all that I have for Tell from the Crypt number one what would one. you say your favorite story was from these three my favorite story from those three um Believe it or not, it was actually the first one. I, okay. I liked the second one a lot. I liked how they played the fact that he was crazy the whole time. But for some reason, I liked the first one better. I don't know if it's because the 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 mean um, guy was such a such a jerk. Like, cause you they follow him through it. the whole story, and he was a jerk, and yeah. you just couldn't wait for something to happen to him. And in the second story, you know, you follow the crazy guy, and you're actually sympathetic to him. And you're kind of like, man, you know, something better needs to happen. I felt bad when he walked in and saw Julie with the boss. But, like I said, the first story just did it more for me. Yeah, I'll have to go with thinking about it now. Talking about it a little bit. Um, I'll have to say the third one. I like the detective aspect of things. Like, even the people who work for the people who get rich are uh, in hard times but yeah that was Tales from the Crypt yeah was it worth the wait for you say that again so was it worth the wait for you mm. <laughs> not really yeah me either I, I, I just don't like I didn't like the fact that we had this comic set for the show and then it got pushed back at the last minute and then we had it set again and then it got pushed back and then we had it set again and it finally and then it came out when we didn't even schedule it we just we were just like we're gonna do it when it comes out and i just happened to be in the comic book store and saw it that day and was like we, we gotta do the book <laughs> I, I don't I'm, i don't like starting something and not finishing i'm one of those types of people and I was like, we said we were going to review this book, so whenever it comes out, I want to make sure we, we review it, yeah, whether it's good, whether it's it. bad, whether it's, you know, great. Was it worth the wait? No. Especially considering the fact that this was more something we wanted to do for Halloween. Halloween, yeah. We're kind of out of that because scared each, now. <laughs> if, if any of the listeners go back and listen to any of the shows from October, we always had at least one book that was like a horror kind of related book. Like, it had something Halloween related with it. Either it was either it was Halloween in the book, or it was something that had to do with um, some kind of monster or whatever. Yep. Awesome. Cool. We can move on from there though um, into our Marvel book, first Marvel book of the night. Um, this is Scarlet Witch number thirteen, um, written by James Robinson. Um, art by Jonathan Marks uh, Bera Fashieva. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. And color <laughs> artist uh, <laughs> and color artist Rachel Rosenberg. If I could give art of the week, um, I would have to. This would be a toss up between this and Batman for me. If we did art ratings, but we should, we'll do that next time. Um, but getting into it, um, just a quick uh, summary with no magic. Uh, currently in the the Marvel Universe, that is correct, right? The magic. Yeah, there's no magic. Yeah, okay. And so yeah, with no magic in the universe, Scarlet Witch finds herself uh, taking a journey with Agatha, and without um, magic at the moment, Scarlet Witch seems to be growing old rapidly, and um, you know losing li losing life. Um, recently, finding out her mother is the um, previous um, Scarlet Witch, Natalia Romanov. She learns from her mother she must travel Witch's Road and uh, face many threats in order to, you know, find the 
find the answer to where where this magic is and where her magic lies really probably um, after facing some demons familiar foes allies and even lovers um, she reaches the end of the road um, but only to find out it continues and uh, which is road only just takes a different form at this point and that is portrayed in the art um, we'll get to the art but what did you <clears throat> and I wanted to um, yeah so we had mentioned James Robinson before and um, but like, like I said this is one of my favorite books um, the opening scene when uh, they uh, Agatha teleports them and that cruel the cruel person is like terrorizing this village and they like quickly uh, wipe them out uh, when Agatha tele teleports them like onto them uh, that was great what did you think of this issue um well I wasn't quite sure how a Scarlet book a Scarlet Witch book would stand alone on its own mm -hmm. um, because it's one of the things Marvel's doing lately is they're giving books to characters they haven't traditionally had books I was a little unsure at the beginning. I did love the art in the book. The art was amazing, yes. especially when you get to her the whole journey down Witch Road, and it yeah, it, very... it was reminiscent of when we read the um, Doctor Strange book a little bit because it was like a lot of surreal visuals and stuff going on. Yeah, a lot of multimedia and, collage type artwork. Yeah, and I also thought Agatha was funny. Yeah, and she I thought was. the I thought that the interaction between between um, her and the Scarlet Witch was hilarious, especially she, when she was like, I wish you were this funny when you were alive, and she was this funny when I was alive. I just kept all my jokes to myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, even Scarlet Witch I cracked a joke to her at one point, you know, about getting yeah. old and getting old. So that finally came yeah, but she was yeah. I like the visuals. I like the idea of her going on this um, journey, and then she finally met her mother. I actually liked the end part where she's fighting the um, essentially her demons almost. Yeah. And they're all like, you know, Captain America and Cyclops and Quicksilver and Throw you know, other people from Toad. the code. Yeah. Uh, and they're <laughs> the characters you know, she knows from the actual Marvel universe it was Preston. Um the only thing I had issue with this isn't with this issue in particular, it's with the whole reorganization that they've done with some of the characters in Marvel is the fact that they are trying to say that um, Magneto was not the father of Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. Yeah, that's been... And they touched on it. it I bring that up because they touched on it in this book when she sees the um, fake Magneto when he's trying to say, I'm your father. And she's like, no, you're not my father. You never were my father. And it just r reminded me like, oh, that's right. Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch are no longer his children are in humans now. I never liked that change. Yeah, me either. But overall, this was, this was a pretty interesting book. Um, I'm on the fence of I would pick up another Scarlet Witch book. Art wise, I, I would just look at the art probably. But I'm not too sure how I feel about the story in this book. Okay, understandable. Um, for me, I, I like the the idea of going on this um, journey with Agatha um, yeah. through these um, through Witch's Road Witch's Road essentially and I think with the art depending on, because that last panel you know the art is it's more of a collage work so I'm, I like how the art kind of helps tell the, the story um, with the with the dialogue that's um, occurring um, what else but yeah like you said the when she's facing her demons essentially and that's a cool little um, all those panels are pretty dope because again Toad you, know, you got the old vision um, even Doom's in there at one point kind of reminded me that, that those panels reminded me of like uh, Chris Claremont, Chris Claremont um, sort of stuff but yeah it has me intrigued to go to follow Witch's Road with them What's funny is I'm kind of flipping through the book now, and um, in spots, especially when you talking about that last, the last page, the spread on the last page. Mm -hmm. 
um, that in particular, along with the first visual of them walking along Witch's Road, and you see the um, image of like the people marching and stuff behind them. It that those aspects reminded me of like a seventies book, like Nick Fury or even Doctor Strange in a way. Okay. Probably more so Nick Fury. I never read much uh, Nick Fury. I, I want to. Just haven't. I I've never read any any Nick Fury, but I've seen retrospects of the um, that time in comics, and I've seen you know some of the things that were being done. And um, Stranko, I believe his name is, was the big artist who revived Nick Fury, and he did a lot of um, visuals and things just like this. Okay. Yeah, I actually went and read. <clears throat> I wanted to read uh, issue fourteen uh, after mm-hmm. reading because I read this first actually, but then I went back and read issue fourteen, and just like a little something to know. I guess um, the person who she thought was her mother um, turned out to actually just be her aunt, um, if I'm if I'm remembering that correctly, and that's when she found out that Natalia is actually her mother. So this is like the first issue with her mother helping her guide her through the uh through witch's road but um but yeah i I like the i guess the the mother mother and scarlet witch aspect like her being the previous one and um, yeah i like that idea i just don't like the whole magneto slash inhuman idea that they've done it's always been i've always been up in the air about that like yeah they should have kept it but that's Marvel for you. Well, that's that's Marvel's rush to say, hey, we can't use mutants and we're about to try to throw a couple of the classic Avengers into the movie, so we got to do something. Let's make them not be mutants in the comics anymore. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I, I understand that, that them doing that, but as a fan, especially of those characters... I like Scarlet Witch. I like Quicksilver, and it just I always like the dynamic of you know because they be, in the comics they became Avengers in the first place to atone for what they did when they were on the Brotherhood. That's the reason they joined the Avengers was they realized what they were doing in the uh, when they were on the in the Brotherhood mm-hmm. was wrong, and they did it because he saved their life. And then obviously they find out later that that was their father, and it was always that thing hanging between both of them. Where it's like, you know, you're our father, we, we love you to an extent, but we can't do this, and we want you to change. And that was always like one of Magneto's weaknesses is the his children. Even, you know, even you see that dynamic, you, you have not remember, they, they had that, that, that dynamic in House of M of how he feels about his children. Like, he, he values his children. Yeah, I started that, but I haven't finished it yet. And when they did um, Ultimatum in the when they had the Ultimate Universe going, and he essentially went crazy when he thought Quicksilver was killed. Like he just he practically destroyed the planet because something happened to his son, and then you take away that motivation for Magneto, which actually gives him a human side, and I kind of don't like that. But that's kinda, my personal opinion. Yeah, they kind of did that in uh, Apocalypse too. Like he didn't really. Sh- they well, he cared for his son, but they did it in a weird, extended out, awkward way. I don't know. But that's a different. We'll touch on that movie at some point, I'm sure. But yeah. overall, um, <laughs> I'm a. I guess I've been a fan of Scarlet Witch and like Vision. Like when I. Those are probably like my one of my two favorites, and their like twelve issue miniseries was really fun. Um, so I've always been a Scarlet Witch fan. I the art is not like this in the previous issue. It is way different, and but this is way better in this issue. So I really hope well, this artist stays on. Well, was the art in the other issue was it kind of like because the art in this issue started off kind of like um, standard comic book art. And then when we got to like witches rolling and everything's where it started getting kind of trippy. Yeah, I would. Yeah, it was more standard. It was standard throughout the whole issue. Yeah, because the, the art in here doesn't really get crazy until we get the witches road. Every time we flash back from witches road, it's it goes back to like it's it's good art, but it's like a standard comic art. Yeah, and then you go to witches road. That's when it starts getting like you know way different. 
Yeah, there's still some non-standard stuff at the beginning of this one, but yeah, it get, it doesn't get really intense until yeah towards the end. But overall, I really enjoyed this issue. Um, I am going to continue reading this for sure. Yeah, I thought it was decent. Where, well, we can move on from there into what we got something next. I did really enjoy. Oh boy. Yes, indeed. This is uh, Champions number three. Um, I actually did not uh, read the first and second one. I decided just to jump right into this. Um, but yeah, this is written by Mark Wade, who needs to come back and write Daredevil. Um, pencils by Herberto Ramos. Uh, inks Victor Alazaba. And colors Edgar Delgado. Uh, so yeah, the champions find themselves defending uh, rights for women and girls uh, in Sharzad, uh, which is in a South Asian um, fictional country. Um, Sharzad is fictional, excuse me. Um, where they are not allowed to read um, or educate themselves. Um, Vin Viv has been monitoring social media hashtags and sees that there are reports of terrorists gunning down children in that uh, town. Um, the issue takes a different approach of getting the team involved with uh, an outside conflict, you know, outside of their home territory. Um, and after uh, assisting the the um, I guess the the heretics is what they said, um, and taking down the radical group, all seems well until the uh, as the team is leaving, uh, they are shot down uh, by a rocket. Um, this was a great issue. Um, Yes, <laughs> the the opening panel with Viv and which, Hulk like making. Which I have questions of. I have a question <laughs> for you from the opening of this book. Go ahead. My question to you: Did mm -hmm. you say that? That because first of all, in the open, are you talking about the actual physical um, opening panel of yes. the books or the actual first panel of the story uh, of the story or the okay. of the book? I guess. I, Vivin. Well, the, the the books had me confused at first because I saw the books and you see the blood and everything, and I was kind of like, okay. And then you turn a couple pages and it's it's pretty much nothing. And then you get to that page of Hawk kissing Viv, and was not expecting that. I guess if we would have read the issue number two, we would have saw that coming. But yeah. that threw me off. I'm glad that. And it would also it. threw me off. Is, look, say that again. So I'm glad they explained it there real quick. Oh yeah, which is cool. But what threw me off was the fact that because um, I haven't been following uh, the champions, um, I had heard of this team, didn't really look too much into them, didn't look at too much of the you know any of the covers or anything. So I didn't know who all was on this team. Viv Vision, because you read the Vision miniseries, and I still have not. Mm -hmm. Is that his daughter from the series? Yep. Okay, because I was wondering about that, because I'm sitting here like, okay, we have a young female Vision kissing the um, the new Hawk. Yeah, they and they kind of and that whole thing was funny. They kind of spoiled that. Uh, well, I got spoiled by it because they released the Champions lineup before the Viv book was over. Mm -hmm. So it was like, up, oh, I know Viv lives. <laughs> oh, yeah, but it, uh, it's it's still cool. Whatever, whatever, Marvel. But that 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 threw that threw me off because, like I said, I, I have not read the Vision mini series. I'm going to eventually, um, and so I saw her and was like, okay, so Vision obviously has a daughter now. I'm kind of glad to see that he is able to find a way to because that's something that him and Scarlet Witch have wanted for a while. Mm -hmm. we've, we've had drama over them not having children, uh, but that was interesting. The one after whole entire page because you know she, she says how she wondered how it would feel to kiss Astro you know what did she think she like wasn't that good you know they didn't do anything to my sensors or whatever and it's funny because you can kind of see Hawk's thought bubble and you see yeah, his heart breaking, his breaking. <laughs> and then she, and it, it was like well perhaps I should try to kiss the different gender and all the people look at Miss Marvel she's like nah guys I don't feel like experiments <laughs> no, not in that experimental mood and it was just funny. Hawk's reaction was funny because you know, because you just see, you know, he's like, "Yeah, it wasn't that bad. She's synthetic. She's not even really real." But yet, and still, you can kind of see his mind that he's hurt and like, he, "Man, that really hurt." I, I actually do like her, and it was really magical for me. It's a shame that she didn't enjoy it. 
I didn't expect her to. I was like, I kind of glad she did because I would have kept kept uh, kind of in continuity with how she is in the book or in the previous series. But yeah, and then that's when they uh, that's when she's like following the the hashtags and which I thought yeah. was funny. They put hashtag champions and then hashtags again. Yeah, I saw that too. It was like, but, but you know what? It it bothered me when I first read it. But I always like Vision, so yeah, it makes sense. That's something Vision would have probably had had said. Makes sense. Yeah, then his uh, I'm following hashtag Avengers hashtags. And then you got a uh, Hulk's uh, his uh, ship that appears out of nowhere, and they're all like freaked out. Oh, his hot dog. The, yeah, the hot dog ship. <laughs> uh, is that what it's called? Looks just like the Oscar Mayer winter van. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of does, but yeah, then um, yeah, then they uh, fly off. Um, but yeah, then while they're on the ship, they're like butting heads over uh, who the team leader is going to be. Um, this to is great. me because I agreed with the idea that Cyclops should be team leader. Yeah, I, I that or Miss Marvel, but just the fact that like they kept like hating on uh, Cyclops, like kept bringing up all the. You know, bad things about him and whatnot. Well, it was funny because Nova suggested Cyclops, and obviously, uh, the show didn't like that idea. But it made the most sense. Like it made like what Nova said. You know, he's like, "What about Cyclops? He led the X and he has experience." It's like, yeah, he he's actually led a team before. None of you guys have actually led a team. Mm-hmm. I understand, you know, it was Miss Marvel's idea to put the team together, but that doesn't make you later. Yeah, one of my notes we'll get to later um, as we get through the book. Um, but yeah, and then that's when they go to, uh, you know, stop the um, the terrorists from, you know, about to kill, kill the women. And um, that's when they come up with the uh, plan. At that point, it, we meet, um, her name was Amal. And it was um, in order to, you know, they didn't want the Avengers or champions uh, to be seen, you know, on national television showing that, you know, the people of their own town can't protect their um, their city. Um, so Amal is, you know, comes up with a plan to, you know, it's a unique plan to protest and uh, have the champions evolve that way. And they have Cyclops, or they have a group of, it was like Cyclops. Who was down below? Yeah, it was Cyclops down below. Cyclops Viv, down below. And Hulk. Hulk. And then the rest of yeah. the team was, um, you know, above ground, um, you know, dressed as the protesters as well. And uh, Miles has like a um, you know, hoodie, around him, hoodie around him and whatnot. And the, the plan is for them to protest because the terrorist group doesn't, again, doesn't allow, you know, women or girls to be able to read to educate themselves so the women are fighting back and they plan to protest by you know crowding around and you know protesting and showing the books because books aren't necessarily you know you're not even they're not even allowed to hold a book um you know at this point so they so again yeah they they start the protest and then that's when cyclops viv and hulk um from underground um you know blast and kind of shoots them all. I'm not sure if they killed him or just put him on stun. <laughs> but they... Well, they, uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the thing. This is the thing. I, I hate to stop you right there. No, go ahead. But pe people don't realize Cyclops' optic beams are concussive, like they're... Which, which means it's like being punched almost. It's, mm -hmm. they're, they're not really lethal. And I know a lot of times, especially in the movies, they make them like they're actual lasers. They're not lasers. Like, they don't burn through. They don't melt and everything. They're concussive. Yeah. And, uh, Miles had a good moment, though, um, when he finally appears and uses his web slinger to catch the rocket. <laughs> but no, yeah, I just thought that was a cool, uh, cool idea, like, instead of... You know, showing that uh, that they need you know some type of Avenger or superhero to defend their city. You know, let's let's use you, but let's use it in uh, a different way that you know shows that 
we are in control of our own city and we will you know protest to make what's right um, so I really loved it and you know Mark, the dialogue throughout uh, it felt a, a sense of just a young team and Mark Waits yep. pretty good at doing that sort of thing and then they had the uh, argument on the chat again about who be leader at the yes. end and that's when the Cyclops kind of brings up yeah I kind of because I um, Hulk was like, "Who is he? You know, what has he gone up against?" He's actually like, I'm, "I've taken down Vanisher, Blob, Eunice, Magneto, the Mariner," and then Nova's like, "You have to admit," <laughs> and then uh, Hulk gets admit real nothing. Pissed. Yeah, I admit nothing. Oh yeah, speaking of Lewis, then, though, it was cool when um when a mall when a mall came up with the plan, um, and she like oh yeah the order, and then Nova. Was it Nova and um, Miss Marvel? They were like, "Yeah, I vote." Yeah, they're like, "I think she should lead the team." Or Cyclops and uh, Miss Marvel. Uh, yeah, I nominate her as a leader. I thought that was cool. That was that was a good moment. I've been hearing a lot about a lot of good things about this book, so I was like, "I, I definitely want to give." It I a see shot. why. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm glad that that. Um, I think you suggested this last week. Like, I'm mm -hmm. glad you did because this was a, my introduction to champions, and based off of this story, like, I, I think I'm gonna see where this heads. Yeah, same here. I'm. I'm with it. I like how it did the classic, um, like the ending where they blew up the ship. I was just. It should have like a. I didn't a imagine it going dun dun dun. Yeah. Dun. <laughs> what will happen next? Are they still Tune alive? in next champions time. <laughs> next champions channel. <laughs> but again, great job, Mark Wade. And the art was uh, pretty solid all around. I I don't think I have one negative thing about this book. No, I have zero uh, negative things about the book. Everything worked. The dialogue, the art, the actual story itself, the interaction of the characters, like it was this was a good really good book. Yeah. Even for it to be a number essentially jumping in and not knowing what happened in one and two. Same, yeah. Because the good thing about Marvel, they at least always give you the the what happened previously, which I which I do like. Which I don't. Is it in this? Yeah, I guess it is. Yep. And it's not a Civil War tie-in. That's always nice to see. What What's funny is I didn't even read that. The previous, I didn't even read that. I see where it's at. I didn't even read that. Yeah, I just literally jumped right there. into this book. Yeah, I think same here. Uh, that's funny. Viv and Hulk. <laughs> Hell yeah, it's solid young, solid young team. If I was young, if I was like younger, this would be like my Teen Titans when I grew up. Oh. Yeah, this this is going to be some some teens go to book. Like I said, this is going to be their titans. I think that with this, Marvel has like that's a perfect comparison. Like Marvel has found their teen titans, and it's weird because when I saw you know the team, I'm kind of like, how's this going to work? Mm -hmm. But it works. It works. Hell yeah, Marvel! You got you got some good books out there. Oh my goodness. Can't let us hurt that. <laughs> they release so many books, like thirty a week. It's crazy. Hey, hey. Sometimes you do that. A few years ago, DC was releasing like fifty a month. What's that? I said a few years ago, DC was trying to release like fifty a month. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they did the, when they did the new 52, was it right? Originally. Yeah. That's good. It's just good. Um, I mean, I love Marvel. It's just good to see a, a, a good title out there. That's yeah, I know what you mean. That's a tie in. Yeah. Well, I guess that's going to take us to our next book then, isn't it? Because I, I don't have anything else for champions. Not uh, now. No, I'm good on champions. We will uh, definitely continue to um, touch on this book from time to time. Oh yeah, this is going to probably this is going to pop up again. Our next book is going to be Harley Quinn number nine. 
Uh, this is actually a very interesting title. And uh, it picks up with Harley Quinn having a black and white dream, um, but she's essentially in the Wizard of Oz um, on the farm in a tornado. And she sees the Wicked Witch, like, you know, Dor Dorothy sees in the movie, except the Wicked Witch is the Joker. And the uh, house lands in Oz, crushes Batman, and gives her Batman boots. And she is told that she needs to go see the Wizard and Oz which, if anybody's seen the movie, you know how that goes. Um, and it turns out that she's actually been at the hot dog stand um, talking to her quote-unquote therapist who runs the hot dog stand. And he, she is asking him, what does her dream mean? Because he essentially kicks her out and says, like, you know what? Um, I've been nice. I'll let you say extra 15 minutes. It's time to go. And he tells her that she has trouble seeing things that are just right in front of her. So she decides to go clear her head and she decides to go to the roller derby, which she hasn't been to in a while. This is something she did in the beginning of the Harley Quinn series. And she meets up with her roller derby team and it turns out that um, somebody she faced in her first time at the roller derby, Big Bertha, is back. And she's been all healed up. She's gone to the doctor and she's just been unbeatable since she got back. And she sees Harley and instantly she wants revenge. And she actually starts beating Harley up when she's going to crush her skull. And then a figure steps in and shoots Bertha in the head. And this figure looks suspiciously like somebody we know. And it turns out that one of her teammates picks her up and um, carries her off. And then Harley goes into um, this weird hallucination about eating rainbows and bombs being dropped that are uh, that are painted a little like super Hero and wakes up from this, this hallucination and she's told that you know maybe some damage to her head her uh, friend has somewhere she let somebody save her life and she immediately thinks it was Red Tool that's the only person she can somebody in the head to save her and Red Tool says it wasn't him to the doctor the doctor says you know your head's fine you know everything above your neck is fine but you might want to come in in a couple weeks for a physical just to get checked up so Harley decides to go out and get some pizza and clear her mind and the pizza place is robbed and she tells the owner like I'll take care of these guys for you if you give me life lifetime free pizza and he's like money Harley says forget that and she takes the criminals out and says like I'll will you give me free pizza and he's like yes I'll give you free pizza just hold them there until the police come and um so she gets her pizza to go, and she runs into a homeless man on the street, and at home, she asks him, you know, how he got there, and he tells her a story about his wife dying, and he just didn't have the heart to go home, and she touches Harley, and so she gives the old man the pizza, and she kind of sits there with him and hugs him for a little bit, and then she decides to go home, and when she goes home, she sees that the door to her room is actually open, and so she's wondering who in the world went into the room, and as she walks into the room, it's the Joker sitting in there. Did you miss me? And that's where the issue ends. Did you have any opinions on this book? So overall, I was not um, expecting this um, out of this issue from what we've gotten so far um, on the the books that we've covered on here, at least. Um, I'm not the you know biggest Hollywood fan reader. Um, I don't read a lot of her stuff. Um, but I guess I just didn't expect this. I mean, I guess it's kind of expected because I know Harley can be a goofy character or is a goofy character. Um, but I guess I didn't expect this w Wizard of Oz take on things. And it kind of introducing it to uh, Joker in a forced way. Uh, well, this step when the um, World Derby thing is, but the um, Wizard of Oz the hallucination they've only done like one other hallucination I can think of um, the, the roller derby was something they did originally because that was uh, one of her jobs that she got with New York she was a psychiatrist by day um, in the underground roller derby by night and big birth in the, um, one of the first teams that she faced and she took her out so she's been MIA for a while which is why she wanted revenge so you were saying that your um, feeling on the Joker is that you felt he was rushed in this issue or, or forced? Yeah, forced. And and I guess um, forced in a weird particular way. I 
I don't necessarily think that he was forced um, for the only because we've been following like the last four issues of Harley Quinn and um, they've actually been hinting at something going on with the Joker mm-hmm. and even when they because the first thing was the, um, the bar of soap and I said back then like oh I wonder if they're teasing the Joker if he's going to be making a um, popping back up again yeah and then they did the, the the her little flashback when they met, and then they did the show um, the um, notes from the first session they had. Yeah, the cycle. And then the, I think it was another flashback. Yeah. So in in a way, that's why I don't think he was forced because they kind of told us he was coming. But it is the Joker, and you never know when the Joker is going to show up, what he's going to do, or anything like that. So it, it kind of has to come out of nowhere. Yeah, I guess just the thing that might, maybe bothered me was. Um, you know, while all this is happening, especially at the roller derby rink where um, the shots fired, and you know, we all, we, everyone reading it knew it was Joker. Um, but during that time, she, you know, she called Red Tool. Yeah, she, I, didn't, I was... she didn't know if it could have been him, but the whole time I was thinking, like, you, you got the psych report recently. Uh, well, yeah, you got the psych report and the soap necklace. Like, she played it off like she didn't know who it could have been. Or is written that way that she didn't know she had no idea that this could have been Joker and I don't know. Well, she she went on the vacation with Ivy and Ivy kind of helped her kind of sort of put it out of her mind. And from he it looked like he was standing like around the corner or something. So yeah, I mean, it looked I like there was a pillar there. Shot. Yeah. So in in her mind, probably you know I was in danger. Somebody you know shot and killed somebody. I know Red Tool is trigger happy. Maybe it was him. So I don't think at this point she was even expecting him to even show up. Like maybe send her stuff and mess with her a little bit, but to show up, which he does at the end of the issue, and what's funny is, um. It seems like, because remember, there's three Jokers now. Mm-hmm. And the Joker we see seems like the old school Joker. Yeah. I would agree. Like, he's got the, the classic, tra- he's got the traditional Joker suit on, the traditional little Joker, the hat that the he wears and everything. Yeah. And even his, yeah, it looks like more the traditional Joker. Remember, I was wondering, like, well, there's three Jokers now. Are all three of them going to head? You know, to find Harley, and she's got to pick out which one is her Joker, or how are they going to do this? For me, it opened up a can of worms because I'm just curious as like to which Joker this is now. Uh, that is a good question. I didn't think about that. I just figured, I just figured Harley Quinn was on uh, acid this entire time, and maybe that's why she was kind of loopy. Because <laughs> the art, the art was pretty cool. It was pretty, you know- it was pretty tripped out. Yeah, the, the the little her hallucination mm-hmm. with the rain. Yeah, that was that was great. I like the way that they did that with all the cats and stuff. And poison ivy was there, and then she's looking at the painting that she was just drink thinking about thinking in her about, brain. Yeah, I think the my favorite thing from this book was probably the character bombs that were coming down on them. Yes, yes. Was I was looking at that. Were you trying to pick out who was all on the bombs? Yeah. There was, like Rob, there was a couple Robin, I didn't Superman, recognize. Lito. It's all elastic, man. All the ones that, that on there, Flash, Green Lantern, Blue, Robin, Batman, and Superman, and Aquaman are all the ones that you can help the Atom. Mm-hmm. There's there's one that you can kind of see that I don't know who that is. I can't think of who that is right now. But yeah, but the end was that was awesome. And I guess it was, it was kind of relieving for Harley to uh, I guess uh, take some time to bash some heads after getting back from a, a vacation, and she's you know kind of stressed out. Was she stressed out? Remember. She- in the last issue because Ivy wouldn't stay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, still dealing with that. So then we can move now into um, Batman. 
the bat book of the week is what we have well here. actually um we we have a book before the before the batman oh, we you, have the uh the all new wolverine number 15 you are so very right my friend and i will let you take it away that that's what i'm here for <laughs> Um, well, I'm over, we pick up I'm over here too busy. I'm over here too busy dealing with these uh, these technical difficulties that we're having. Oh yeah, so we, yeah, it, we it sound... happens. Some 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 weeks everything works perfect, and some weeks everything wants to fail. It's like Murphy's Law sometimes. That DIY podcast life, poor man's podcast. <laughs> but yeah, back to the book. But uh, we we pick up with all new Wolverine number fifteen, and we have a uh, Fury and Shield are still lo- looking for um, Laura and Gabby, and uh, Nick Fury informs that they're they've contacted all of her connects like with the X Men, and they've all said they haven't heard from her and they are not going to help her, and of course the other Shield agents are curious if Fury's going to believe that he's like no I don't believe that we're actually monitoring every aspect of their lives. And then, um, of course, as we know from the last issue, Gabby and Lore made it onto a um, pirate ship um, with the uh, Captain Ash, who's going to take her to Madripoor. And they have a little dialogue back and forth, and then there's an incident on top of the ship because they're in a storm. And one of the crates falls, and Gabby says that she hears something, and Lore goes over there and actually um, helps save the... Uh, well that comes later she goes over there and helps them with the the um uh crate that falls sorry about that my mind just blanked for a minute and um later after the storm clears uh she actually laura goes and talks to ash and asks her why are they holding off so far from madripoor and tells her that she knows what's um in the crates like she heard what's in the crates and they have a little um incident because Laura sees choppers coming and realizes that she's, they've been sold out. So uh, after she gets shot, she takes down Ash and opens up the crate, and it turns out the crate is full of um, children that are being shipped to Madripoor. Um, while this is happening, uh, Gabby tells Laura that there's something going on up there on one of the helicopters, and a um, guy named Roughhouse actually jumps out the helicopter and lands and threatens to start a fight, and then he's stopped by um uh how what is her name Bellonona Bellona B- uh, Bellona I believe yeah Bellona that wow I was reading this earlier mm-hmm. and read it perfectly now that I have to say the name out loud I can't say it don't worry you helped me on but uh, um she stopped tyrannical <laughs> <laughs> see that's that's teamwork people teamwork. teamwork I had him last week he got me this week um. But uh, she actually stops him and tells her that um, they just want Wolverine to come with them. They didn't even really want the children. Um, they were supposedly supposed to buy the children, but that was part of the ruse to get Ash to actually um, bring um, Laura and um, Gabby to them. And so uh, she agrees to go. Laura says, I'll go with you if you let the kids free. And she says, fine, we'll let the kids free. And she orders Ash to take the kids back to America, drop them off to the authorities. And Ash, as a pirate, says, well, my um, reputation is on the line if I don't actually deliver the merchandise. And she's like, well, we're paying you to take them back. She's like, it's not about that. It's about my reputation. So um, she shoots Ash and it tells the second in command to take the kids back and drop them off and that she's going to actually send their people with her to make sure it's done. And then she tells her people once the kids are dropped off to kill everybody on the ship. Um, and then, of course, Laura is taken back to uh, Kamara, and Kamara gives her a little lecture about the fact that Laura is a weapon that's all she'll ever be, that she's Kamara's weapon to use as she pleases, and she says that she's going to torture her, and then make her go out and do stuff, and then bring her back and torture her again, and she's causing her little murder machine, she's her X-23, and then she says, let's begin, and that's where the issue ends. Um, what was your what were your thoughts on this? This isn't really where I thought this story was headed. Um, me, either. I, you know, we figured they were going to Madripoor. Um, we, you know, figured we'd make their way there. Um, this this arc is a little bit of a slow burn um, right now for me. Um, yeah, it's not what I expected. Um, you know, I expected some interaction interaction with Ash 
and um, Laurel and um, and Gabby, but I figured we would have got a little bit more into Madripoor instead of stopping, you know, halfway point. Um, it almost mm-hmm. seemed like a tease, like a little bit, like up. Oh, we're almost at Madripoor. There, but, but wait, there we, it is. You we, see it? We got it's, it's over there. You see it? <laughs> you can see it. Um, yeah. One thing I did like though was the fact that Ash, when she shot uh, Laurel, um, she like she mentions to Laurel, she's like, you know, Logan would have been more, wouldn't have been as trusting, and he, and she was very right about that. Um, I thought that was a good, oh yeah, good line. Um, the art took a turn at parts. Uh, since the previous issue, I'm not sure if it's the same artist, but um, some of the faces at points were a little goofy looking. That's what I thought you were going to say, especially um, I think it really at the scene where uh, Gabby's telling her like I hear something, and they get that close up shot of Gabby's face. The faces look a little yeah, wonky. Is that that what you're looking for? Yeah, there's that one, and then. When well no 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 that not that one's um well when she's talking to Ash after the fact that one's a little wonky okay. and then when I think uh, when she's getting like held back by the guys mm-hmm. like I know there's like it shows like it's trying to show expression you know but I don't know it looked, it looked a little off opposed to some of the other stuff but yeah I mean I felt we got a. Uh, uh, a slow burn teaser out of this now that I mentioned the fact that like they were almost at Madripoor like I I would have liked to have seen them get into Madripoor and then you know get captured um I could have been been more into that opposed to stopping halfway through <laughs> and not getting close well I, I was thinking because remember originally I said that they are probably going to go to Madripoor and it was going to be an issue or two of them um, basically searching for information like you know going to, to the, the hangouts of all the criminals and everything yeah, and that would have been nice and essentially trying to beat the information out of everybody to find what they who they're looking for and I think doing it this way kind of cuts that out because to me that would have been maybe an issue of them beating you know through the bars and then finally at the end of that issue they were begin ready to enter the facility and then you know then we go to the story from there but with this we skip all of that and we're starting off the next issue with them already in the facility in front of the people they're looking for mm-hmm. so it's 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 kind of a slow burn but in a way not necessarily a slow burn because it just cut out all the legwork of them having to travel to Madripoor get to Madripoor hunt through Madripoor find the, the the facility go into the facility work their way up to the to the top of wherever she's located in that building and now she's already there true that cut by cutting that um yeah i mean i'm i'm still i want to see how the how it unfolds um before we definitely before i, I do definitely too. judge the whole arc but yeah it's and kind I, of a side story you know with the children too you know, them protecting yeah. her. And another thing, I thought um, uh, Belna, you know, she wasn't as cold as I thought she would have been because she was very... Exactly. Very friendly to um, Gabby opposed to, you know, wanting to take down uh, Laurel. Laurel. Yeah, Laurel. Um, so quickly. And she, and she was even like, take the kids back. Take them to the authorities, free the kids. Mm-hmm. Like I wasn't expecting any of that. The, yeah. I wasn't expecting her to be as nice to Gabby and them as she was, and I wasn't expecting her to say, "Take those kids back and free them." And then there's even a panel when it's like towards the end. Um, she is like um, after they put the cuffs on um, X twenty three. Um, she uh, Bell or Bellona or Bellona, excuse me is walking her to the helicopter and you see Gabby like instead of uh, Bellona holding both of them you know Gabby's kind of holding on to her saying like don't do this so yeah I thought that yeah, was so interesting don't, don't do this yeah and then the I guess r- uh, rough yeah rough house is like an old um, Wolverine villain that I found out Mm. But overall, I don't, not I don't where, remember Rough House. I guess another issue I didn't expect. 
I didn't expect uh, Bellina to shoot Ash <laughs> after she got. Oh, her. I did. I didn't either. Especially after she especially got. Especially after water. she just had her hand cut off and yeah. thrown overboard. <laughs> and Bellina even like had had them go like fish her out of the water just to shoot her. <laughs> yeah, well, she the thing she wasn't going to shoot her yeah, until she was like, "Are you? You know, I'm not going to do that." And like, "Are you sure?" Like, "Yeah, I'm not going to do it." Bam, you're dead. Okay, who's who's second in command? Yeah, but we are we all are so uh, also back to trigger scent stuff, and they're teasing her again with trigger scent. So we'll see what happens with that. I might be getting, hopefully. I will say one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and this is one subject, but yet yeah, it's off subject. I love the cover for the next issue. That's the picture oh, I was good. talking about before when they were talking about. Um, the upcoming books a couple like a month or so ago and i was asking you about the uh x23 with the weapon x gear mm -hmm. yes yeah, it, it was that cover it's this cover to the next issue which is sure. funny because it looks like she's got the trigger scent being injected directly into her body yeah hmm i'm not curiouser and curiouser yeah i'm definitely curious as of what they do with that, I don't know. I'm not like super excited for it. I guess because maybe they'll just do a different spin on it, you know, from Logan. But I, it, but it's also Marvel, so this could just be a uh, quick teaser, or not even teaser, but a fake out, kind of like a, hey, remember, remember Logan? Well, we're gonna do this to X23 on this cover. I, th I think it's going to be similar, but I think, because at first I thought it was essentially, you know, just a cover they're doing because, you know, it's his daughter, you know, they got a lot of the same background and stuff, so they're just doing it for the fans, like, hey, like you just said, remember when uh, Logan was Weapon X, and mm. look, we're throwing this, this is the cover, but now that I see, like, the, what looks to be the, the trigger scent, and being injected being into injected, her body, yeah. I think it's going to be a little bit different, it's going to be similar, but different, I think. She has, like, ten vials, like, stuck in her. Yeah, like she's got all those vials of trigger scent stuck in her, and then she's got a remodified Weapon X helmet on her. Which was the goofiest moment of Apocalypse. <laughs> when oh, the, my Logan goodness. was running the, off. You talking about their attempt to do the, the Weapon X? <laughs> yeah. Well, just, I guess the whole scene I, of I'm them a, running off was pretty funny. I'm a sucker, and that was one of my favorite things of um, Wolverine's history is, is the... I'm one of those people who like the Weapon X gear. Like it was silly, but I just like the it. fact that they put all that on him and was doing all those experiments and training and brainwashing and stuff. So when they did it in the movie, I was kind of happy they were giving like a, a nudge to people like me. But at the oh, same yeah. time, I was kind of like they could have did the helmet a little differently. They kind of forced this in here at the last minute. It yeah. seems <laughs> P people won't see an X Men movie unless they know Wolverine's in it. So you guys are gonna be pretty screwed coming coming up real soon. But yeah, overall, I was not uh, I wasn't disappointed in this book. Um, it's moving along. I so. wasn't either. Yeah, it's just moving. I wasn't along. disappointed. It it. It, it took a couple of turns I wasn't expecting from this story arc, but not bad turns in my opinion. Like I said, putting her right there saves a lot of the, the stuff I thought was going to happen and gives it potential to, you know, just have some crazy action now because she's in the facility. Yeah. Anyway, but uh, that's, def that's all I got for um, All New Wolverine. All right, cool. Yeah, same here. Um, we can now, let's move into, um, now we can move into our Bat Book um, of the week. Yes. Um, which is Batman number 12, uh, written, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, written by Tom King, uh, pencils, Mike, J or Mikhail Janin, uh, inks by Mikhail Janin and Hugo Petrus, uh, and colorist, uh, June Chung. And so this time around, uh, we're showing the letter Batman sent in reply, um, to Catwoman, uh, Bane taunts taunts Batman to make his way to uh, rescue Psycho Pirate uh, while Batman makes his way through fighting off every guard in the prison. Uh, we're given a different side of Bruce um, in this issue uh, revealed through the letter that you know he has sent to um, Cat 
um, you know, Bruce revealed at some point that, you know, he was broken himself, you know, mentally, um, and, you know, was close to, you know, wanting to commit suicide. Um, but, you know, before he can, he, you know, becomes stronger and makes the vow to, you know, strive, um, to strive past the death of his parents. And Batman believes, and this is maybe a theory or my perspective in the summary, but um, Batman believes um, that Kat took the rap for the bombings um, and believes that she did not commit those. Um, there the issue ends with Batman kneeling in front of Bane, Cat, and Psycho Pirate um, as he's made his way um, through the army. Um, you want to, anything you would like to say first? After he ran through the whole facility, like he <laughs> took that army out. <laughs> this was this like, was like some great Batman action in his book. This was like the raid with a love letter to Catwoman for dialogue. Yes. And if you haven't Which seen was, the raid, anyone go watch that movie, and then you'll know what we're referencing. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, well, first let's just point out the. Well, I'd like to point out the art through this entire book. Um, I cannot give enough praise for the the art. Like this art and Scarlet Witch art is up there with for my top picks for art. Um, my God, fucking Michael Janin and the whole whole team on this book just did some amazing splash pages and all kinds of great pam oh man it's so good so good um but you know getting into the story though um you know tom king is really going into deep into um bruce's psyche you know and you know kind of we're seeing a a sadder side of of bruce that we don't see often um and you know like i mentioned in the my little recap you know just maybe my the way i see it but he possibly believes that you know Catwoman did not cause these bombings um, at the orphanages. But that could just be me see, reading that and seeing it that way. How do you feel? Well, I'm I'm with with Batman and with you. I don't think that she did it. I think that she she did take the fall. Um, maybe because maybe similar to um, when we did the Suicide Squad with the with the Killer Croc backup issue. And how he decided that, well, if people see me as a monster, I might as well just be the monster. I think maybe that's where Selena was at. People, she thinks people see her as this villainous cat woman who's just, you know, a menace to Gotham and everything. Mm -hmm. So if they're gonna, you know, even think that she did it. Why not just say like, yeah, I did it. You guys are gonna blame me anyway, so I might as well just say I did it. Let's see, yeah, uh, cool. So I'm not the only one, at least between the but both it, of us. It, but Batman's um his his um letter in here kind of harkens to what I was saying, where he still thinks that he can save Catwoman. Catwoman can be saved, mm -hmm. and he has even though we don't see his evidence, but he's pretty much deduced that she didn't do it, which leads me a little bit more strange and makes me a little bit more excited that I might get my wish and and have him bring her into the fold a little bit more. Yeah, I think so too. Um... I don't think they want to make her a, a monstrous person, or DC at least doesn't want to make her a monstrous person. And you know, Tom King setting up uh, something, even though like I, I really wanted answers because this is the fifth issue. I think. Uh -huh. I was just saying, like, even though this is the fifth issue, I was like wanting answers really bad. But the second time through, I was like, you know, I know Tom King is setting up something and you know it's kind of, this is kind of like watching uh Westworld. I know uh you haven't watched that show yet but like you know picking out so many picking up so many things and so many theories um that could possibly happen like this is kind of like when I read this issue it kind of what it feels like is a Westworld type not giving you much uh but you know giving you hints of things that you know may come I mean, when we first started this arc, you know, I was saying that, um, what well, Zach, I'm about to say now is that Catwoman characters grow and evolve. I think the character of Catwoman and even the character of Batman and his dynamic has grown to a point where 
there's no need for her to play that villain role anymore. There's really honestly no need for Catwoman to be in his rogues gallery of villains anymore. To fake the funk. I mean, there, there, it, it's, to me, it makes zero sense. You know, other characters, it makes sense to keep them in that position. But Catwoman is, is one of those characters where it just makes no sense to me to keep having her as a villain. And this does seem to be leaning towards the idea of getting her out of that position. And the, the, I'm still curious about these letters because the, um, not the not the last issue, but the issue before that, she wrote him the letter, and mm-hmm. then in this issue, he's writing her the letter. And I know this was a little controversial, I guess, this week. With the, I was wondering what the controversy was over this issue, and it's the, it's the stuff in the letter. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I took out of the 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 letter. And what caused some people to be, you know, a little iffy or upset about the issue is the fact that in the letter he talks about a point in time after his parents died when he was still young where he committed, where he contemplated committing suicide. Um, I didn't, I personally didn't take that as um, an origin or change. Um, I thought of it more as a, more of a, just a thought like, hey, it, we don't know that. You know, he never thought about that. Um, I could be wrong myself, but, and... but I know. No, go ahead. But I, I just was going to let me let me say this real fast. I I, I know that um, I'm sure you're aware when this issue came out this week, um, there were some some articles and some, some a few people that seemed to be upset about something in this issue. Yeah, I remember because you they were me saying that, that it, it changed Batman's origin a little bit. Yeah, I remember you had mentioned that we had we spoke earlier this week. I I hadn't read it or seen any of them personally yet, but I yeah. I well, I, I didn't read you know what what their take was. I wanted to go into this fresh and mm-hmm. not have like you know someone else's article have me looking for things. And after reading the issue, that's the only thing that I can see that people would have taken from this issue as changing Batman's origin is the fact that he had a moment in time where he was contemplating and according to the letter he was actually getting ready to commit suicide and then he had that breakthrough where like no I'm not going to commit suicide I'm actually going to dedicate my life to honoring their, my parents memories yeah I mean now that you mentioned that I mean I do want to go um and read those to see to read them to get their views and thoughts as well because just to just to compare really um our thoughts um but yeah the the panel of him climbing up the castle or the prison yeah i'm looking at now my god i don't think i've had to flip a comic yes you know that way to look at a page in a while <laughs> But it was yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. That the whole from the beginning of the book. If you're not, we're not talking. Not not going to talk dialogue. We're just going to talk Batman right now from the beginning of the book. Since you're talking about that, the action of him running through this prison, yes, and just taking everybody out. And every page is like you're seeing Batman is determined. This is the Batman people are thinking of when they think of Batman. Then you get to the part where he's scaling the building. And it's like oh my goodness, mm-hmm. like flip the page and. He, you can see he's really scaling this building. He jumps in the water and swims by a sh- swims by a shark. Like Batman was just on fire in this yeah. issue. <laughs> like he was just determined. Yeah. Then you get to the part where he's in the room full of soldiers and he's like ducking through them and jumping over them and punching people. And we can say he was running the court. <laughs> Yeah, like but this is ridiculous. Like, I haven't seen it. It reminded me almost of the Arkham game. Oh yeah, <laughs> where you just get like a that. bunch of goons coming at Batman, and he's like punching this dude, and then you flip over here, and you're hitting this dude, and he's then the that's defense. what it reminded me of. He's in the defense button, and then the attack button. Oh, fun, t- fun game. Yeah, and then like, you get the shot of him after he's beating everybody, and he's got like blood dripping from his face, and he's walking through that hallway through. like, "Yep, yeah, I did all that, and I'm coming for you now, Bane." Yeah, and then he gets into the room with with Marlon Brando, Bane. And it's funny you mentioned that. Like now that when I read, if Bane is in this book and Tom King is writing it, when Marlon Brando or when um, Bane has any dialogue, I I hear Marlon Brando from Apocalypse Now when I read it. 
Hey, they they did it that way. They they decided to to light it that way, to draw him that way. Like it's I'm thinking apocalypse now. Yeah. So a lot will be answered now too. You know, since they announced that uh, Batman Catwoman, you know, two issue arc, which makes me mm-hmm. makes makes me now want to go into um, well real quick before I go into that the. The uh, three villain panels before Batman, you know, as Batman's being the last two dudes, the panels yeah. of Catwoman, Bane, see, and Psycho Pirate. Those were yep. Those are so, uh, just the art throughout this whole book was pretty great. Um, but that leads me into if you what theories um, do you have for the outcome? The outcome of this? Yes. Um. I definitely think that Batman's going to have, obviously at this point, he's got to have a fight with Bane. Um, I think he's still going to dominate Bane. I think we're going to find out that um, Catwoman went a little off script, but yet and still she's still on script. I think she called an audible and slightly changed the plan just so she can get that close to Bane. Mm -hmm. And Psycho Pirate. Um, I, I, I really think that she used deception. That's one of Catwoman's things. I think she used deception with Bane in order to gain his trust and be able to get that close. I don't think she really betrayed the team. Um, at this, with that being said, because last issue we saw, we we thought we saw her kill three of the team members. I'm not even sure she actually killed them. Yes, same here. And I think I, she might have made it look like she killed them. Catwoman's pretty proficient with those claws and everything. Like mm. just like Batman, she's a pretty proficient fighter, and I'm pretty sure she would know where to hit or where to cut somebody to make it appear like, you know, yeah, I caused you know a lot of damage, but I didn't actually hit an artery. Yeah, they're, go, ben, they're going to live. And ben or maybe too. she. Well, well, maybe she she pulled a Batman, and maybe she's actually got some kind of sedative on her on her claws. So when she clawed them, mm. it got into their bloodstream. I, I thought about and that too. The made them day, appear actually. dead. Yeah, it's funny that uh, so Ben from uh, Nerd Church actually he actually mentioned to me after he listened to one of our episodes because we had thought she had slit Punch in Julie's throat. He uh, she only snapped uh, Punch's neck. She actually didn't slit his throat. If you go back. Which is interesting. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. Like I yeah. think she just she nipped it, but with those claws and where she sliced it, it then the blood that would have came out, it might appear like she killed him. And I even commented when she when she did Bronze Tiger, I was like, well, you know, it looks bad, but we don't even know if she used her heel or her mm-hmm. foot or you know what it was. Like yeah. she did stump on his head, but that doesn't mean she killed him. So I'm going to go with, here's uh, some of my theories. One, I think Bane might have to do something with the bombing, <clears throat> excuse me, with the bombings at the orphanage. And that's why Catwoman mm-hmm. is trying to get so close to him. Um, oh. Worsker is still out there and possibly maybe used against Psycho Pirate. So maybe. Catwoman would take out Bane first in order for Wesker to be able to get to Psycho Pirate. Because it seems like all the guards are down. <laughs> um, and maybe Batman, oh, All the guards are done for. There, yeah. there are no guards at this point. And maybe Batman will you know, finally break Bane's back after Catwoman has her way with him. Or is just oh that would be so poetic if Batman <laughs> broke Bane's back that would be poetic because in the beginning of the series uh, or the arc he's like it's time to break Bane's back and the whole that yeah he did kept saying that like that's yeah. all, all he said in the first the the uh, first part of the arc the whole issue that's all he said yep oh that, that would be awesome so yeah. I can I can let this slide, even though we didn't get you know many answers. It was I'm glad he played it uh, using Batman's reply letter this time through before possibly ending this arc next issue. But I think the next issue should be if it is the next arc, it should be the last arc because it says the last stand. I, I think the, the next issue will be the last part of this arc. Then we got jump into the um ho the Catwoman Batman. 
two issue series two they were doing. Series, yeah. And I definitely um, the, the art will let, let me let, allows me to let this slide. I actually did enjoy the letter. I didn't enjoy it as much as um, Catwoman's letter and other issue. But there. this was a, a good letter because we, we got a, a different look on um, at Batman and we see how because I mean obviously he's dressing up as a bat like he says crazy and everything what he does mm-hmm. so we already know that you know he took his parents death really hard but for him to have stuff in there about you know suicide and everything and holding the blade in his hand and looking at his wrist and thinking about it like that does add a new level to show how deeply depressed and upset he was as a child when his parents were killed and still and then of course still might hold it yeah and then of course the bad action through the book like this oh my goodness the i raid. wanted a bat book like this for a while where i just get to see batman run through an army and just destroy the army straight up the raid only if he only if he would have been in a tower well like pretty much he was in a prison tower but if he would have just like had a staircase fight throughout would that be too daredevil they already did it <laughs> <laughs> but well, no, still this, still the way that he took this, out this this was guards. awesome issue I've, I've been saying that since we've been doing this i am suicide um, um arc like it, each book has impressed me like there, there hasn't been one where i haven't been impressed or haven't enjoyed it no not at all same here well it was a quick read it was it was, and that was because it was mostly the letter, and then yeah. Batman is running through, beating people up, beating the shit out of everyone. Man, laying people out like he, <laughs> man. Yeah, I'm trying to think if, there, if there's anything else I, I had for this book because I wanted to mention. Any no, I don't, I don't have anything have. else. The art was superb. But yeah, I think we covered just about everything we could in that book, for the most part. Um, but yeah, <laughs> we can um, let's move on to uh, our second to the last book um, of the night. Or no, yes. it, this is our last book, right? I know I'm correct. I'm incorrect. Uh, second to the last book of the night, uh, Nightwing number ten, um, and Dick finds himself. Um, moving back to Bloodhaven and has took up a job mm-hmm. volunteering at a local community uh, for teens affected by violence. And while Dick is uh, getting settled back in, um, there seems to be a you know a, a villain, at least, in town um, snatching people up and killing them. And the mayor seems to be focused on keeping the casinos in town for revenue purposes. Um, but due to the fact that people do not feel safe in Bloodhaven, you know, no one visits um, the town to, you know, spend their money. And, you know, while this uh, meeting is occurring, um, uh, uh, police choppers are chasing uh, Gorilla Grimm. And Grimm attempts um, to, you know, tell Nightwing that he has been set up. And, you know, as he's telling him, as he's being tased by the police and taken away. And so back at um, the Haven, which is the, the uh, local the volunteering community, or center, excuse me, um, Nightwing goes to visit Sean Sang um, and finds her suiting up as the defacer. And so before we uh, get into this issue, this is kind of um, both the new books for us because um, I've personally, I can't remember if I've read a, a single um, like solo Nightwing book before. And I think you had mentioned that as well, right? I read a the Nightwing issue. I've always loved the character. It was my my favorite Robin. Same. He, um, you know, graduated and became Nightwing. Yep, from the old Teen Titans series. Yep. But this this was my first Nightwing book. Yep. So I just wanted to point that out there. Yeah, we are. This is kind of our uh, a random book, I guess you can say. Our, our jumping on point. And kind of is a for the most yeah. part a good a good jumping on point because he is um, you know returning back to Bloodhaven and he's um, you know trying to you know uh, take time to readjust himself and um, get back to you know normal normal life I guess and get a job get his own apartment um, and whatnot but the the opening of this uh, issue 
it shows it has a uh, Damien, you know, on the standing on a gargoyle, uh, <laughs> <laughs> working on his like Titans call, and um, so Batwoman kind of like calls him out and you know make it's making fun of him because it was kind of a bad, um, kind of a bad uh, Titans call. I'm trying to remember what he said. It was like we or form us Titans or something like that. It was goofy. To me, Titans. Yeah, to me, Titans. That's what it was. <laughs> He says, to me, my Titans. <laughs> and then Barbara's was like, Robin? <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. But one thing, as they're talking, one thing that stuck out to me is they mentioned uh, Tim's funeral. And, you know, we're not, I'm not sure if they had a funeral for Tim in Nightwing at all, but I know they didn't have in, one in Batman or Detective. Um, so that was interesting to hear, but surprising that we, you know, didn't haven't seen a funeral um, for for Tim, you know, since his since his quote unquote death. So I thought that was interesting that they had mentioned that, um, and and the fact that we, you know, still have we didn't we haven't seen uh, a funeral for it. And then you get to see Batman's face as he's like lurking around the corner listening to them talk. Mm-hmm. Then, he's, yeah. he's got like the sad dad face. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, he does. Poor guy. Let's go get a little bit of interaction, um, little cameos from them real quick, because they're like, because that's where Damon's like, Damien is, uh, you know, setting up how the fact that um, Tim has to move into uh, Blood Ivan, because I guess they, him and Batgirl, had some sort of falling out during the uh, previous uh, series. Um, but yeah, so he's you know back at Bloodhaven for the first part, uh, for the most part, I mean, and you know we get this the attack of the uh, of this first victim, and it's kind of funny because um, on the front door, you know, it has the um, all deliveries in back, and you know the guy's talking on the phone, and it, you know he gets a buzzer a buzz, and he mentions you know why he's on the phone, he's like. Um, yeah, it must be someone's at the back door. It must be the delivery guy. It's a good thing I put the uh, you know all deliveries in the back sign. I just thought that was kind of weird because obviously you would think it's the you know deliveries if it's you know, the buzzing from the back. Uh, that was a little nitpick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was a little nitpick of mine. Um, but yeah, he gets snatched up, and we we don't see him for the rest of the issue. And then you know Dick is um, you know volunteering at this or is interviewing to be volunteered at the um, at the Haven, and we kind of get this psych out um, therapy session. You know he's kind of speaking to himself, you know about how um, you know, certain things he wants to change. He wants to trust people again. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and you know kind of just uh, you know discussing things about him, uh, talking about Barbara, mentioning her. But it's all just a psych out, and he's thinking it to his own head as he's uh, accepting uh, the job at the uh, at the Haven. And uh, Sean even uh, hits on him at one point, uh, which I thought was. Did you catch that? Yeah, <laughs> that, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I caught that. Okay, yeah, it, it, it stuck out pretty um, like a sore thumb. Um, but yeah, then, um, but yeah, Sean, I was like, uh, awkward. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get the, the squealy, uh, goofy looking guy who kind of looks like Tom Holland. Um, when he has his hand, wow. with his arm wrapped he around does. Bruce. <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, then, but we also get, uh, Grimm, uh, from Gorilla City. So I thought it was pretty interesting to hear Gorilla City mentioned um, just you know finally oh they re I think they mentioned it they touched on it in Rebirth um, but this is the first time since then if not that they have mentioned Gorilla City um, that I know okay. of um, so it was cool to hear that Gorilla City is still around and you know possibly uh, might come back um, was there anything what else do you have anything on this as well um, I did think that the um, him trying to be normal was was fuck the Robin Hood book, and then he was reading Robin Hood Rebirth number one. Yeah, I saw that. Mm -hmm. And then he started watching TV. And mm -hmm. what was really funny is 
He only sat. He he did all this in like nine minutes. Because right. it starts at eight thirty one p.m. with him reading the book, and then he reads the other book, and he's watching TV, and he's talking on the phone, and then he lays out on the floor, and it's eight forty. You're right. I didn't even notice. Good call. What's so the... he he tried to be he tried to be normal for like nine minutes. <laughs> it takes longer than that. Yeah, that was the first thing I noticed about that page. Like, I read it and was looking at it and was like, what What time is it? 8.40? Wait a second. Didn't it say 8.31 at the top? I thought the rebirth thing was a little a little pushy. Oh, that was hilarious. A little forced. It was funny because he, he read, like, most of the Robin Hood book and then he gave up and was like, I'm just going to read the rebirth book. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the art was kind of, um, felt like a mix of, like, anime esque, uh, especially the panel of him uh, from the eight thirty to eight forty uh, page had the anime oh, yeah. feel to it. It definitely had an anime look to it, and then him mm-hmm. suiting up like every, yeah, it was it was definitely like an anime ish type look. We have um, back to when he was um, at the interview and uh, taking the job. the the guy The guy's name was James Nice, and he had mentioned to um, to Sean. That that uh, he mentioned something about they someone needed to put the costumes on tonight, so I assume they were mentioning you know maybe possibly setting up uh, Gorilla Grimm uh, for for whatever reason that they have, uh, but essentially I mean it almost seemed like this book was set up to well the story at least um, you know since the whole city was you know. Uh, pretty much, since Bloodhaven is pretty much a shithole and no one wants to go there because they're prey to get robbed and you know there's no revenue in coming into the city you know they need to get a uh, get some monsters out there to try to get a superhero um, for them to feel safe and now that you know he's back in Bloodhaven you know it's kind of setting up um, that there is a new that there is finally at least a uh, vigilante in town who can make the people feel safe, quote unquote. They're trying to get the ratings up. Well, the, and... the uh, the thing was, he said they need to put on the costumes tonight. Not not he or you. He said they. They, yeah. which means there's more than one of them. And since they're dealing with um, children at this, uh, what was like a, it was like a youth center or something like that, like a volunteer yeah. center. Mm-hmm. They talk about deal, dealing with children. I wonder if it's almost like a We Are Robin type thing where they're training these, these young kids to either, I don't know, either be vigilantes or maybe since it's Bloodhaven, maybe they're training them to be some kind of gang. I can see it more going towards um, the Red Robin kind of side, Vig- or making them good vin- vigilantes. No. Yeah, I can see that. Because the Facer, I tried to see what she was from. I believe she, the only thing she, she's appeared in has been uh, in this new uh, Rebirth series. Um, I tried to do some research, but I couldn't find much on her. Um, so I'm not familiar with the Facer uh, personally. But she seems, because that's Shauna who, from, from uh, the Volunteer Worker. And so she seems to be some sort of a uh, graffiti tagger uh, vigilante, which is interesting now that I think about it. What is her powers? <laughs> or not her powers, but what can she really do with spray cans besides make art? Hmm. But overall, I mean, it was kind of just a, a setup issue, uh, kind of putting. Um, you know, Dick back at Bloodhaven and kind of, uh, you know, I put this down as a note that was like, you know, kind of parallel to what Batman has for Gotham, making them feel safe. Uh, Bloodhaven finally has someone now um, to, you know, feel safe around and come out and not have to worry about shit. True. But for your first Nightwing book, what'd you think? Um, it was it was pretty good. I'm kind of interested to see uh, what's going on with Gorilla Grimm and um, the Defacer and everything, and, and who they are. So it definitely planted some seeds that made me interested to see where this is going to go. Yeah, 
Yeah, I plan on <clears throat> excuse me, I plan on following this to see where this um where this whole thing goes. Cool. Well you wanna move on from there? Uh yeah. I guess that brings us to our last book of the night. Yes, and probably um, your favorite book of the night. Say that again? I said and probably your favorite book of the night. Oh, definitely the book I probably have the most to talk about. Um <laughs> and that would be Dead No More, the Clone Conspiracy number three. I'll get to my opinions in a minute. It's hard for me not to want to just jump right into the opinions on this book mm -hmm. for a minute or two. Um, but this picks up with uh, Spider Gwen, uh, that Spider Woman from you know from Earth sixty five, and Spider Man still making the getaway in the air vents, being chased by the lizard. And um, they actually managed to stop the lizard and the rest of. Um, the Jackal's henchmen, or I won't even call them henchmen, the rest of his um, renewed clones have um, decided that they need to go and look around the facility to try to stop them from escaping, and obviously they don't. Um, meanwhile, while this is going on, um, Scarlet Spider has the um, revived Gwen Stacy um, back at the uh, Horizon Labs where they're trying to figure out what exactly is in the pills that the um, these clones have to take and he tells them his reason is because he's been to other Earths where this has happened and what ends up happening is that they end up mutating and they become um, like zombie type creatures and they get this virus and they spread it and um, they ask him how he knows and he says well I have the um, carrion virus and um, because he's one of the original clones and they're like well you somehow have managed to survive and live all these years with it so there's a chance you might actually have the cure inside of you we should be studying you not her in these pills and while this is going on they decide to call the police and it turns out that the police chief is actually uh, one of his renewed clones his new you patients and phones it in to the doctor to um the jackal and the jackal tells his people to go pick up Gwen and get the pills and grab Scarlet Spider and come back um, also it seems that Doc Ock has developed the next step in the process that um the Jackal has, has been working on, and the next step is to actually clone a blank body and then insert memories and stuff into the body instead of actually cloning the, the whole um, host. Um, and this is also the time when Dr. Ock suggests that Jackal just kills Spider-Man, kill Spider-Gwen, clone him, and then he'll have him under his um, his thumb because they need the pills he, he has. No, I want Peter to come to me willingly. And he will. You just have to know how to work somebody. Anybody has a price. So um, Spider Gwen tells Spider Man that she's actually working with Scarlet Spider. He says, "I've figured that out, and that he has all of her gear, and that they need to." That um, last time she talked to him, he was at Horizon. They need to go. Um, they may place the call, and it turns out right at that moment they're being attacked by the Rhino and Electro. Who defeats everybody, grabs Gwen Stacy and Scarlet Spider and leaves. And Spider Man and Gwen get there just as they've already left and see the police and everybody. And then they're approached by Wilson Fish, the Kingpin, who says he knows exactly where the Jackal is going to be and that he has the information he wants. He's been tracking the Jackal since the incident with his family and the, the new U program. And that if he gives the information to Spider Man, Spider Man owes him. He tells him that if I do this for you because you want him just as bad as I do I don't owe you anything if anything you owe me so Kingpin gives him the information and Spider-Man actually goes to this meeting and um, knocks out the people that the Jackal is meeting with and tells him this is where Ant is going to stop here you're not going to do this anymore and he starts to try to web the Jackal but the Jackal was like moving really swift and then he starts fighting the Jackal and knows that the Jackal can dodge every punch and kick he throws and he makes the comment like you've never been this fast what are you doing and then he hits Spider-Man in like a nerve and he's like how did you do that you've never been that strong you've never been that fast and then his response is because it's a little bit deeper than you know I'm a little bit darker than, than what you actually realize like I'm a dark red and he takes off his helmet and reveals that this jackal that we've been following through the last couple of issues is actually Ben Riley, the original Scarlet Spider and he tells him 
I want you to join me and if you join me I'll give you something that you really want we have the technology to bring back anybody no matter how old long they've been dead no matter who it is nothing's off limits and this box that I've got is actually the remains of Uncle Ben the one person you would want to bring back with your company's technology we can accomplish great things so join me and then it ends there with, with Spider-Man thinking about Uncle Ben I, I want your opinion on this before I get into this okay um, I need it I need your opinion before I say anything yeah that works um, but yeah cause you, you, you're the biggest Spider-Man fan of us so I'm sure you have a lot to say um, <sighs> overall for me I did I um, enjoyed this issue I kind of saw the um, his Uncle Ben thing coming when I saw the case. Uh, I, I did like, too. I was like, "That's Uncle Ben." Um, I did not see uh, Ben Riley coming until the mention of when he said, "I'm darker than red." I was like, "Oh, I know who it is." Um, other than that, the the Spider Man Gwen team up um, when they're in the sewer or in the pipe with. Um, with uh, what's lizard. His name? lizard, yeah, and they're like, uh, what do they say? Like, you know what I'm like? They both say, do you know what I'm thinking? And they like kick him down the uh, the pipeline together, and Spider Man wraps him up. Um, I thought that was a cool exchange between those two. Um, other than that, um, all kinds of you know twist um, in this book, in this issue, really. And yeah, I love the um, the fact that this is. A, a massive amount of villains going after essentially one person. They're they're all after Spider Man. Two, two know, people. Gwen, Gwen is there, but she is just collateral. Like it's just yeah. It's kind of interesting to see all this team up of villains going after this one person. Um, Kingpin being involved, another big twist. I thought that was really cool to you know for him to be upset about uh, Vanessa. Um, but I'm not even sure if if he's involved because I knew we probably both knew at some point that uh, Peter was going to go to Jackal. Like we, you know, he's a little, he's probably a little stubborn, and I think we both knew that you know uh, Ben Riley knew what he was doing that he, and that he would come. Um, I do have a question for you, Chief Anderson. Um, I assume she's been around for a little bit. I actually do not know. Okay. Um, that kind of got me too with that. I was wondering the same thing, or if that was just them trying to show that Everyone the reach that he has yeah. is, is massive. Because yeah. uh, the, the original Gwen Stacy says that. She says, her find me. He's got lots of high friends in high places. That makes sense. Yeah, so I can. I, th I thought I, f I felt that was just in there to show us, like, yes, he actually does have like a lot of powerful people or people in, in important positions that he has under him now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of uh, Jackal's. Well, can we call him Jackal at this point still? <laughs> <sighs> no, uh, I guess no. Nah, I guess we can't now. Now we can't. I guess we can't. Yeah. So so Ben Ben Riley's dialogue, um, I thought throughout some of this was hilarious when he was like making fun of Rhino um, and Electro. He was like, you know, don't let you, uh, don't electrocute anyone this time, you know, after he sends them off. And he's, you know, kind of just being a dick to everyone. Um, I found some of, that, some of that hilarious. And and that should have been a red flag to me. To me, that should have been a red flag. Because the first two issues, he really wasn't, he was kind of composed and he wasn't cracking any jokes. And he started cracking jokes in here. And... Ben Riley is a clone of Spider Man, which means that he has that in him that to humor, yeah. wanna make, you know, sly comments here and there. And he did that as a Scarlet Spider and he did that when he was Spider Man for a little while. Like he, he kept that tradition going. So that right there should have been a flag to me, like, wait a minute, I'm not sure if this is who we all think it really <laughs> is. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed uh Spider Gwen in this the <laughs> I like the uh, when the, they roll up to the uh, to the Horizon Laboratory on the like Iron Man. Oh, she's, she's like, uh, so do you have a spider cycle just sitting on standby? Yeah, <laughs> and then they go over to her like hoopty, and he's like, it looks comfy. 
Yeah, then they that, and I like the interaction between the two when um he was like, so what's the deal with, with hopping over to my universe? You think I don't know? Like, I know you and spider Woman have been having dinner dates. Like, yeah. we, we do talk. I like that. I like that they mentioned that in there. I thought that was a really nice touch, and I'm glad they did that. But for for me, I got to get to it now. I have to say it. The reveal at the end blew my mind because I was I was just saying this whole entire time when they were you know talking about bringing all these people back and I, I've been saying every issue like yes, Ben Riley yes you have bring bring Ben Riley back <laughs> and I don't know how to feel I don't know how I feel getting my wish but essentially finding out that he's the villain like that just I don't know how to how to how to process that. <laughs> like that's just I, if you can't tell, I was a huge Scarlet Spider fan, and I even for a little while picked up. Um, uh, I think it was still Amazing Spider Man when he took over mm-hmm. for Peter. So uh, I had an attachment to Ben Wright. Like I love his Scarlet Spider suit. I liked his suit when he became Spider Man. He changed it up a little bit, and. I was really upset and hurt when he died. And all these years, I've always been like, you know, whenever I talk to people about Spider-Man, and we talk about, you know, favorite costumes or favorite spider characters, I always end up mentioning um, Ben Riley. I always end up mentioning Ben Riley and the Scarlet, but the original Scarlet Spider. And I know it was a messy situation with that whole um, clone saga that he was involved in, but I thought he was a great character that came out of that. And when they killed him and got rid of him, it hurt me. So when I saw this and saw they were bringing everybody back, I wanted him to come back. Yeah. And then he comes back as the villain. And I really don't know. Like, I, if, if you guys can't tell, like, this is really, like, tearing me up. I was going to say, were, were there some man tears drawn after this issue? <laughs> say, say that again? I said, were there some man tears drawn after this issue? No, I was just like my mind was blown because just like you said, it got to the part where um, because you read this issue before I did, and you mm-hmm. said you really wanted to know my opinion on this issue, and that instantly had me like, oh well, you know they probably you know bring back Ben Riley because that, that's the clone conspiracy clones. That's all I've been talking about with this book is Ben Riley. Yeah, and. Then we get to the part. We get through most of the book. I'm like, they're not. I, I thought it was Ben's remains in the um, the box. I, I thought Uncle Ben would play a part, but part of me thought like, okay, Uncle Ben's gonna be like backup plan. His first thing is gonna go to Ben Riley, and then he says Uncle Ben is in the box, and then he starts talking about you know being darker, darker than red, and I'm like, wait a minute, hold up a sec, and then he flipped the page. And you see the reveal of his face, and I'm instantly like, that's Ben Riley. Like, he's got different hair, mm-hmm. but that's Ben Riley. That's great. Which he comments on, because he had his hair, his hair was blonde in, in the 90s, and he dyed it. What are, your, what, are, what are your thoughts on them bringing Uncle Ben back? I knew Uncle Ben would play into this somehow. I knew, I, I kind of thought that he would go ahead and clone Uncle Ben, and the next time Spider-Man came back to try to stop the Jackal, that he would do you he think would snap his fingers or something, the door would open up, and Uncle Ben would come out. Do you think they'll like? Do you think they're going to bring Uncle Ben back into this universe? And, <sighs> and if they did, how would well, you feel about it? Being like a you know, being the Spider-Man fan you are. If if I don't know, I'm I'm conflicted because I can see one of two things happening. And one is if they actually figure out... Well, now that I'm starting to talk about I can see three things happening. One, and first and foremost, is if they figure out an actual cure. If they can use um, Kane to make a cure to the uh, the carrion disease or carrion virus or whatever it is, I can see them bringing back Uncle Ben, giving him the cure. I can see most of these people getting this cure and sticking around. And then Uncle Ben will obviously, you know eventually probably find out he's Spider-Man or he wouldn't find out he's Spider-Man he finally works with Spider-Man or something like that and, and be still his mentor um, thing number two is they bring him back he finds out Peter is Spider-Man they don't have a cure Uncle Ben dies but as he's dying he tells Peter how proud he is that he's actually taking what his, he taught him to heart he's actually 
practicing great power, great responsibility. Thing I, number three. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'll go ahead. Oh no. I was gonna say thing number three is they don't bring Uncle Ben back. Like in the next issue, he completely and utterly just refuses to do it, and or he says he's gonna do it, and Scarlet Spider them stop him at the last minute, and then they bat- battle it out. Hopefully they don't kill Ben Riley. Maybe they make him see the error of his ways and he becomes the Scar Spider again. Fingers crossed. Please, 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 please. I like two and three of your um of your thoughts. Um yeah, if they do bring him back, still have him pass away in some way and or them stop Spider Man before, you know, he makes that decision. Cause I, I, even though I'm not the biggest Spider Man yeah, fan, I, I, don't, I almost I almost, oh no, excuse me, I almost see it as, like, if they were to bring back Bruce Wayne's parents. Like, I think it would just, yeah, change, it would just exactly. be, it would change the game, not in a good way either. <laughs> and that's exactly what I was going to say, was like, if you, if you bring him back, it, it, it's, it's bad because that's what sparks him to actually become Spider-Man. Yeah. And I was a little in with the idea of doing anything with Gwen Stacy after all these years. But some characters in comics need to stay dead. Yep. And Uncle Ben is one of those characters. Yep. And like, if you're going to bring him back, bring him back just long enough to find out Peter is Spider Man, give him his blessing, and then doing, die. Yeah, that he's doing well. And then, yeah, I totally agree. So that that's that's how I feel. I don't want them to kill Ben Riley. I want Ben Riley to stick around. I think he will. Like I said for them, but see, I want him to roll. Like I really, Kane is cool. I came when they first introduced him. He's cool. I was a little upset when they gave him the Spider title, but. Ben Riley is the Scarlet Spider to me. So, you know, halfway, you know, have them say Ronnie Hart was in the right place because you were you wanted a world where nobody died and everything, and that's that is respectable, but every you know, you were a little misguided, you know, you didn't kill or hurt anybody this time, so we're not really gonna like, you know, do anything crazy somewhere for about what he's done, have him him realizes and then boom bring him back and have him be a hero again yeah yeah overall uh enjoyable enjoyable read um for myself how many is this uh how many issues is this total four this is this is three i believe it's four so the next one is the last issue okay okay I think uh, sure next, four. I think next week is if uh, Miles Morales is Spider Man issue. I think it's issue twelve, and it's the one where yep, him gotta and, pick uh, it up. Yeah, him and uh, Gwen. Y- yep. So mm-hmm. we're, we're probably gonna be covering that next week. I'm uh, sure. uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm call- I'm calling it now. I know. I know. We know we normally pick our books um, off air after the show. It was picking. But um, I'm calling right now. If if that book is coming out next week, uh, we will want it. I've been waiting for that book. I've yeah. Yeah, you've been talking about that for a while. Yeah, I, I think I might have mentioned it like in episode one. You m- might have. Nice, cool. You got anything else for that? <sighs> no, I don't. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you have a lot. I think I got right? it all out my system too, and. and no, I think I got it all out until issue four comes out. Oh yeah, yeah, we'll wrap it all up. That's cool. Well, let's um, let's do our rankings this week. Um, I'll go ahead and start off uh, with my rankings for this week. Uh, eight books total. Uh, let's see. Okay, so number one, uh, Champions. Number three, um, great jumping on point, even for being a third issue. Thank you, Marvel, for doing that and being able to allow a new reader to actually jump on to a middle 
uh, you know, half not halfway, but you know, somewhat, you know, the start of a, a series, and not feel left out. So great job on that. Great job on the story, Mark Wade, uh, one of my favorites. Um, I'm gonna have to say after talking, it was gonna be Scarlet Witch, um, but my number two is gonna be Batman number twelve, um, just because I think that it's gonna be a nice payoff, and I trust Tom King. And the the action alone and the the art uh, was just superb. Um, my number three is going to be Scarlet Witch number thirteen. Um, I I enjoyed the, the little journey that her and Agatha took, um, and we you know get introduced to um, Scarlet's you know new mother, um, and the art was really cool. Um, stuff I really really haven't seen in a while with the whole you know multimedia and collage with uh you know normal comic book art uh blend was really nice uh number four was um let's say clone conspiracy number three um it was a good continued to be a, a good read um for me being a you know not a um a connoisseur on on spider-man but just good storytelling and some solid twist and there's a lot in this book which is cool um my number five is going to be Nightwing number 10 um, for you know we, both of us Dick Grayson you know is our Robin and getting on you know jumping onto this book um, kind of just you know showed us um, kind of what he's getting into and that he's you know made a home base in Bloodhaven and you know, we'll see where it goes from here um, all new Wolverine uh, number 15 I wish it could have been um, before you know my uh, five or well my my four or five, um, but it didn't deliver as I thought it would have. I thought it could have been a little bit. It's a little bit of slow burn, uh, and a little bit of a tease um, with the extra side story that was kind of just thrown in there um, for the sake of it. I feel um, my number seven is going to be Tales from the Crypt number one. Um, I, there's only really you know one out of the three stories um, I really enjoyed um, not being too familiar with tales of the crypt tales from the crypt excuse me um, yeah, I guess I, I wasn't it didn't uh, I guess it wasn't one it wasn't worth the wait um, of the delay and I just don't think it delivered for that th for the wait that we did but we promised that we would cover it so that's why we wanted to make sure we did it. Um, and then eight is going to be Harley Quinn number nine. Um, it just felt like a wacky LSD Tim Burton uh, film to me, with a little bit of weird Joker stuff. So that is my that's my rankings for uh, for this week. Um, I'm intrigued to hear hear yours now. Well, after giving it some thought, I had to let reason dictate how I chose my list because what was going to be my number one book is no longer my number one book um, number one for me this week is going to be Champions um, good story good characters, good art Like I, I like the book, it was a good book like you said, for someone who's never read Champions before, this is my first book it felt good to pick up a number three and still feel like, okay, I can ride with this mm -hmm. um, my number two is going to be Batman number twelve uh Yet again, this is this has been strong. I am suicide it has been a strong art for me so far. I love this book. I I like the letter Batman wrote. I like the art, and I love the action of Batman running through the prison, is beating everybody up. Um, number three, which was going to originally be my number one, was the Clone Conspiracy number three. Shocking! I thought that was uh, your number one. It, it was so close to being my number one, but then I was like, we had some other books that had some really strong story elements. Yeah. And this was a good, strong, you know, it was a good entry to the story. It moved it along. The biggest thing for me with this issue that would have made it my number one was that reveal of Ben Riley. And I just felt like, given the books we had this week, I couldn't let it be number one because of how that, in, that reveal impacted me. Mm -hmm. So that's why I had to move down to number three because Batman and, and Champions were really really good books this week yeah uh, number four is all new Wolverine number 15 um it did throw us for a loop with where they took the story didn't quite go where I thought it was 
um, they did kind of have an extra story element thrown in there that in some ways didn't really need to be in there um, but I'm interested with, with where it leads the story by putting them right in the facility with everybody so I want to see where this is going to go with the next issue uh, number nine uh, number what is this <laughs> five uh, yeah number five I know I just said well if you can't tell by my miss my misstep there of my words my number five is Harley Quinn number nine um, I like Harley Quinn books. This was an interesting book. The the main draw for this book for me was the inclusion of the Joker. Um, I wasn't expecting him to come back this soon. I was expecting maybe a couple more issues before he came back. But it raises my curiosity as to which Joker we're dealing with because I'm immediately thinking there's three, three Jokers. So which exact Joker are we? Uh. My number five book is going to be Nightwing book. Like I said before, plenty of times, I love the character Nightwing. This was a good book, especially for someone who's just reading it. Um, similar to, to Champions, jumping in deep into a run, um, jumping in at a number 10 and fabulously missing anything. You can keep going with this easily, and the story flowed pretty good, mm -hmm. and some funny moments in it. Uh, my number seven is going to be Scarlet Witch number once again a book that I've never read which is still in her series um, I like the art especially when you get to the surreal stuff going on with her going through um, the, for the this road um, I did like the interaction with um, her and um, at and um, did like the reveal of her actually meeting her mom at the end. Mm -hmm. um, I also did love the f the visual of her fighting these demons that look like people she knows. Some good cameos. It was a pretty good book. Of course, that means my number eight is going to be Tales from the Crypt number one. Um, just like you said, it, it burst weight, but we said we were going to do the book and if I felt we needed to do it um, I do think that possibly this when it was originally supposed to come out it would have been higher on the list um, but it enough justify being pushed back that much guessing that maybe it was pushed back more so the artist could do the art because there really wasn't too too much to the and for you it was one for me it was really just like one and a half that I thought were really good stories mm -hmm. so that number one at number eight on my list this week okay I'm a little bummed Scarlet Witch was uh, towards the bottom of your list but it's cool it's cool <laughs> <laughs> hey champions made it to the top of my list champion it, it deserved it it definitely deserved it for us just jumping onto that book, it, it beat out Clone Conspiracy. Yeah, and I, mean, I read Clone Conspiracy last, so that had the most <laughs> impact on me. Was honestly was Clone Conspiracy because I read it last. Damn, awesome, cool. Um, did you get a chance to read anything else this week for your honorable mentions? Uh, this week, I I did not get a chance. Um. Busy with books this week. Yeah, no, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, I was able to get uh, a couple in. Um, I read, actually, yeah, I, I wanted it's not on my list. Um, so yeah, I read Faith Number Six. Um, I actually read a review for that. You can find that at uh, WeirdScienceDC.com. Uh, it should be posted either today, I believe, or tomorrow. Um, but yeah, that'll be out. Um, I thought it was a cool, cool wrap up to the arc. Um, um, picked up Shade the Changing Girl number three um, it continues to be a, a fun book um, slowly get, slowly but surely getting some, some answers um, about Shade um, and Luma and um, I also um, got a I read an advanced copy of Alien versus uh, well, Aliens Life and Death number four and actually one, it was okay, okay. it was okay 
I'll uh, yeah, we'll talk about that off air. Hmm. It was it was fun. But cool, that is going to bring us to the end of our show. Um, let's see what else. Oh yeah, also, um, if you, anyone, if you hear this in time, on December fourteenth, uh, New Comic Book Day. Um, I'm actually going to be uh, doing a little DJ set on uh, Weird Science uh, Mixler page. Um, so if you are interested, just go to uh, mixler.com slash uh, Weird Science DC. Um, I'll be doing it around 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Again, it's December 14th, New Comic Book Day. So that should be easy to remember. Uh, other than that, um, we did that segment for Weird Science as well. We covered uh, Detective Comics number 101. Um, spent about 15, <laughs> 15 minutes talk, talking about that. Um, you can find that on uh, Weird Science new episode, which is probably out by by now or should be coming out here shortly uh, today. But, uh, yeah, as always, just uh, follow us on Twitter and all that good stuff. Um, you got anything else to say, Alan? Uh, no, just hop over. Make sure you listen to that segment we did uh, where it's the show. Uh, yeah, like you said we did one on one, or as I like to call it now, the Alfred issues. The Alfred issues, yes. Oh, and one thing, uh, yeah. we, get, we can announce that we are for our next movie corner. We're going to be doing the live action, uh, the Giver movie, uh, with Mark Hamill. So that will be. We're going to record that later this month. So um, yeah, probably towards the end of the month, it'll be out. So that's going to be a lot of fun. But Can't other than that, wait for that. Yeah, that's gonna be good. But other than that, uh, we're gonna get out of here again. Thanks for listening, everyone, and to everyone who downloads our episodes every week. We really appreciate it. And feel free to send us an email. Peace. Next week, we'll be discussing Suicide Squad number eight, Detective Comics number nine forty six, Kong of Skull Island number one, All New X Men number sixteen, and Humans vs. X Men number one, Power Man and Iron Fist number eleven and Frontier, number one.